The Senate will come to order. Will the clerk please call the roll? Senators Baisley, Bridges. Senator Bridges. Excused. Buckner. Coleman. Cutter. Danielson. Exum. Fields. Gardner. Janal. Gonzalez. Hansen. Henriksen. Hakez Lewis. Kirkmeyer. Senator Kirkmeyer. Excused. Coker. Liston. Lundin. Senator Lundin. Excused. Marchman. Michelson Janay. Excused. Malika. Pelton B. Pelton R. Priola. Rich. Roberts. Rodriguez. Senator Rodriguez. Simpson. Smallwood. Excused. <laughs> Senator Smallwood is here. <laughs> Smallwood. Excused, right? Excused. Sullivan. <laughs> Van Winkle. Will. Winter. Excused. Zenzinger. Senator Zenzinger. Excused. Kirkmeyer. Lundin. Mr. President. Here. Good morning roll call is 30 present, zero absent, five excused. We do have a quorum. Senator Roberts, would you please lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance? Thank you, Mr. President. Colleagues, please join me in the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Approval of the journal. Senator Pelton. Thank you, Mr. President. I move that the Senate Journal of April 9, 2024 be approved as corrected by the Secretary. You have heard the motion. All those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed, no? no? The ayes very much have it, and the motion is adopted. <laughs> Senate Services. April 10, 2024, correctly printed Senate Bill 204, Senate Joint Resolution 19, correctly engrossed Senate Bill 164, Senate Memorial 2, correctly re engrossed Senate Bill 189, correctly re revised House Bills 1222 and 3041, correctly enrolled Senate Bills 23, 24, 25, 66, 94, 115, 132, 145, 176, and 178. Message from the House. April 9, 2024, the House has voted to concur in the Senate amendments to House Bill 1392, House Bill 1409, and House Bill 1425, and has repassed the bills as so amended. The House has passed on third reading and returns here with Senate Bill 68. Committee reports. April 9, 2024, Committee on Local Government and Housing. After consideration on the merits, the committee recommends following House Bill 1057 be referred to the Committee of the Whole with favorable recommendation. House Bill 1318 be referred to the Committee of the Whole with favorable recommendation. Senate Bill 174 be amended as follows, and is so amended be referred to the Committee on Appropriations with favorable recommendation. Committee on Business, Labor, and Technology, after consideration of the merits, the committee recommends the following. House Bill 1293 be referred to the Committee of the Whole with favorable recommendation. 
Senate Bill 151 be amended as follows, and so amended be referred to the Committee on Appropriations with favorable recommendation. The Committee has had under consideration as a hearing on the following appointments and recommends the appointments be placed on the consent calendar and confirm members of the Metropolitan Major League Baseball Stadium District Board of Directors for terms expiring on August 1, 2027. Ramona Martinez of Denver, Colorado reappointed. Andrew Feinstein of Denver, Colorado reappointed. Eric Caraga of Denver, Colorado appointed. And members of the Uninsured Employer Board effective September 2nd, 2023 for terms expiring September 1, 2026. Shelley Phelps Dodge of Fort Lupton, Colorado to represent attorneys representing injured workers reappointed. Lindsay Erskine of Highlands Ranch, Colorado to represent insurers appointed. April 9, 2024, Committee on Finance, after consideration on the merits, the committee recommends the following House Bill 1089 be amended as follows and is so amended, be referred to the Committee on Appropriations with favorable recommendation. Have, uh, Senate Bill 136 be referred favorably to the Committee on Appropriations. Senate Bill 190 be amended as follows and is so amended, be referred to the Committee on Appropriations with favorable recommendation. The committee has had under consideration has had a hearing on the following appointments and recommends that the appointments be placed on the consent calendar confirmed member of the Colorado Racing Commission for a term expiring July 1, 2026. Jeffrey Rubel of Westminster, Colorado, and unaffiliated from the 8th Congressional District to serve as a registered elector occasioned by the re resignation of Sandra Bowen of Idledale, Colorado, appointed. Will the clerk please add the tardy members, also known as Senators Zenzinger, Bridges, in Smallwood. It's a good group to be part of. Introduction of bills. House Bill 1111 by Representatives Martinez and Wilson and Senator Pelton B. Concerning the adoption of the Cosmetology Licensure Compact and in connection therewith making an appropriation. State Veterans Military Affairs. House Bill 1255 by Representatives Bradfield and Garcia and Senator Bruckner concerning the continuation of the Colorado State Advisory Council for par Parent Involvement in Education and connection therewith implementing the recommendation contained in the 2023 Sunset Report by the Department of Regulation, Regulatory Agencies and making an appropriation. Education. House Bill 1333 by Representatives Hamrick and Bacon and Senator Danielson concerning the continuation of the Private Occupational Education Act of 1981 and in connection therewith, implementing the recommendations contained in the 2023 Sunset Review by the Department of Regulatory Agencies. Education. House Bill 1374 by Representatives Marvin and Rudinell and Senator Michelson Janay concerning means of ensuring that independent contractors who perform legal services on behalf of independent judicial agencies are eligible for the Federal Public Service Loan Forgiveness Program. Judiciary. Third reading of bills. Oh, no, out of order. So now. Mr. Majority Leader. Thank you, Mr. President. I'd like to proceed out of order to have one brief announcement made. The motion is for the Senate to proceed out of order for move it. purposes of an announcement. All those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed, no. Aye. The ayes have it, and the Senate will proceed out of order. Senator Priola. Thank you, Mr. President. Good morning. Uh, members, a bit of confusion with the calendar. Uh, tribute that to the new chair of TNC. We will not be having a meeting this afternoon at 1.30 in Senate Committee Room 352. Let me underline that again verbally. We will not be having a meeting, and we will hear Senate Bill 195 next Wednesday. So pl please disregard the top of page 8 on the calendar. There will be no hearing of Senate Bill 195. You're welcome. Third reading of bills, final passage. Will the clerk please read the title to Senate Bill 1. 64. Senate Bill 164 by Senators Buckner and Lundy and Representatives McCluskey and Puglesi concerning transparency requirements for institutions of higher education. Senator Buckner. Thank you, Mr. President. We move Senate Bill 24-164, third reading and final passage. Members, we are on third reading of bills. Let's keep it down. Make sure everyone knows what they're voting on. Senator Buckner. And I repeat, good morning. <laughs> we move Senate Bill 24-164, third reading and final passage. Will the clerk please add Senator Michelson Janae to the roll? <laughs> Senator 
And will Senator Pelton B please stop talking? <laughs> For the rest of session. <laughs> Mr. Minority Leader. Um, good things sometimes come in threes. Uh, this is the third time we've done this now. Yes. We move Senate Bill 24164 on third reading and final passage and ask for your, not only your attention, but your I vote. Is there any discussion? See none. The motion is the passage of Senate Bill 164. Are there any no votes? With a vote of 34 ayes, zero no, zero absent, one excused, Senate Bill 164 is passed. Co-sponsors, Senators Marchman, Majority Leader Rodriguez, Colker, Fields, Gonzalez, Jaquez Lewis, Priola, Michelson Janae, Bridges, Coleman, Liston, Exum, Mullica, Roberts, Rich, Smallwood, Janal, Cutter, Will, Gardner, Simpson, Van Winkle, Pelton R. I'm sorry, I wasn't paying attention. Pelton B. Please add the president. General orders, second reading of bills. Senator Henriksen. Thank you, Mr. President. I move the Senate resolve itself into the Committee of the Whole for consideration of general orders, second reading of bills. You have heard the motion. All those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed, no. The ayes have it. The motion is adopted. The Senate will resolve itself into the Committee of the Whole for the consideration of the general order, second reading of bills, and Senator Henriksen will take the chair. The committee will come to order and the coat rule is relaxed for everyone. Mr. Hubler, will you please read the title to Senate Bill 187? Senate Bill 187 by Senator Roberts and Representative Herod concerning the scope of security measures for the Judicial Department. Senator Roberts. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move Senate Bill 187. Any discussion on Senate Bill 187? Senator Roberts. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, colleagues, Senate Bill 187, uh, and Senator Gardner will be joining me as a co-prime sponsor between second and third reading, uh, is a uh, bill about security for our judicial officers and judicial buildings in Colorado. Uh, unfortunately, uh, but as many of you know, we've had some serious and alarming incidents at court facilities in the past year, including at the Ralph Carr building uh, across the street. Uh, and so what this bill proposes to do is we've been working with the Judicial Department and the Attorney General's office to allow um, two more post-certified officers at the Ralph Carr Judicial Building that can uh, work in a post-certified capacity to secure that building, as well as secure judicial officers uh, across the state and coordinate with other security at courthouses uh, in, in all 64 counties. Uh, this is a, uh, as I mentioned, a, a pretty modest uh, request. It's only two, a request for two officers, two more post officers uh, within the Judicial Department. Uh, we've also been working closely with the Attorney General on a few amendments, which I would like to move to now if possible. There is an amendment at the desk. Mr. Hubler, will you please read L001? L001. Senator L001. Roberts. L001. Thank you, Mr. Chair, I move L001. To the amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This is a adding a legislative declaration to the bill, uh, talking about the importance of security for our judicial branch and uh, the value of the post board. So, would ask for an I vote. Seeing no further discussion, the motion is the adoption. Senator Van Winkle. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just want a chance to read it. 
It is a full page long. Yes. So perhaps we could just have 37 seconds. You will have 37 seconds starting right now, Senator Van Winkle. <laughs> Senatorial 5 has been requested and granted. Senator Van Winkle. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's appreciated. You have 13 more seconds if you'd like, Senator Van Winkle. <laughs> Seeing no further discussion, the motion is the adoption of L001. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed, no. The ayes have it, and L001 is adopted. There is an amendment at the desk. Mr. Hubler, will you please read L002? L002, amendment for Senator Roberts. Two. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move L002. To the amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This amendment uh, is more substantive. Uh, it goes into the actual statute, but what it, act what it does is say that these post officers that will be authorized by the bill, uh, the two of them, they will be um, temporary, and then the post board will review uh, the uh, recommendation if, the, if these post officers should become permanent. So uh, after a period of time, uh, the post board will review and make a recommendation. If they recommend that they become permanent, they will be. If they um, don't, then their uh, peace officer status will expire on June 30, 2025. Seeing no further discussion, the motion is the adoption of L002. All in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed, no. The ayes have it, L002 is, about, is adopted. Further discussion on Senate Bill 187, Senator Gardner. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Just briefly, I, I am uh, uh, joining as co-prime sponsor of this bill. Uh, judicial security has become a, 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 a real uh, emphasis uh, since uh, some of the incidents, the particular incident at the uh, uh, Supreme Court building, at the Carr building. Um, and. Uh, this will bring us uh, to a situation of having uh, better administration over the security and the state patrol having responsibility for it rather than just under an agreement as they are now. I ask for an I vote. Senadora Gonzalez. Gracias, Mr. Chair. Um, I rise in support of uh, this bill, Senate Bill 187, that we're considering today. And I only want to put down a marker here um, for some of the conversations that I believe that we will contemplate and grapple with over the next, oh, 27 days. Our institutions and our trust of those institutions and our protection of those institutions are very much at the heart of this policy. We have seen the ways in which uh, uh, not a building, a courthouse, but a, an institution is no longer treated with the reverence and respect it once was, it once held. We've seen the, ex the, the extent of damage that one single person can cause. And what does that mean for us in this revered and hallowed institution, which feels a little less reverent every day that goes by? Day 91 of this beautiful legislative session. Day 92, thank you for the correction, Mr. Majority Leader. The, the fact that at this point, we now struggle to protect the institution of, um, uh, within our judicial branch, our co-equal branch of government, as much as, we, as much as we wish we didn't have to, Senate Bill 187 is an important and necessary bill for, all, for us all to grapple with and to, um, I hope, support. What I will um, say is that 
we'll be considering and grappling with a number of bills this session that I think really call into question what are we doing as a state to reaffirm our commitment to democracy, small d dem democracy? What are we doing as a body to restore the trust in our institutions? What are we doing as a body to renew the faith of the people that we work so hard and diligently to represent um, in this body? And that, um, this is in some ways an easy ask, but I think I would just encourage um, those of us in the waning days of this legislative session to think deeply about those questions. Because when we're seeing court staff, court personnel, the very buildings itself, themselves be um, less safe, less protected, should all give us pause. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, um, for the indulgence, and thank you uh, to the sponsors to bringing forward, for bringing forward uh, this important policy for us all to consider um, this lovely morning. Thank you. Seeing no further discussion, the motion is the adoption of Senate Bill 187. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed, no. The ayes have it, and Senate Bill 187 is adopted. Mr. Majority Leader. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move to lay over House Bill 1429 until tomorrow, April the 11th. The motion is to lay over House Bill 1429 until tomorrow, April 11th. Seen no discussion. All those in favor say aye. aye. All those opposed, no. The ayes have it, sorry, to the good Senator from Parker, and uh, House Bill 1429 is laid over. Mr. Majority Leader. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move to lay over Senate Bill 106 to the end of the calendar. Motion is to lay over Senate Bill 106 to the end of the calendar. Seen no discussion. All those in favor say aye. aye. All those opposed, no. The ayes have it, and Senate Bill 106 will lay over to the end of the calendar. Mr. Hubler, will you please read the title to House Bill 1259? House Bill 1259 by Representatives Brown and Weissman and Senator Cutter concerning price gouging and housing rental prices during a declared disaster. Senator Cutter. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I move House Bill 241259. To the bill. So I really appreciate the opportunity to talk to you all about this. This, a little over two years ago, um, one of, our, one of our Front Range communities suffered the most destructive fire in Colorado history. Nearly 1,100 homes were completely destroyed in the Marshall Fire in Louisville Superior and unincorporated Boulder County. In the aftermath of the fire, thousands of families were displaced. In addition to the families who lost everything, many were displaced for weeks and months because their home, many more were displaced for weeks and months because their homes suffered extensive smoke and ash damage. Some standing homes remain uninhabitable to this day. This is more than two years after this fire. While many homes were, just, so many homes were destroyed and many um, families displaced, finding rental housing became a real problem. Landlords did what they could, many landlords did what they could to help affected families, but too many families experienced large, gin ginormous, actually, increases in rents. Families who were renting prior to the fire became unable to afford to stay in the community. This is people who lost their homes, their children were displaced from their schools, their communities suffered, and they were facing the, uh, the possibility of having to move out of their community. So even beyond market distortions from the reduction in supply of housing and increased demand for rentals, the rental market was further challenged by the influx of these homeowners with insurance policies that could cover their rent while they were restoring or rebuilding their homes. Typically, insurance companies are required to pay for up to two years for what is referred to as um, alternative living expense, or ALE. Policies require the company to pay for a comparable home as to what the family lost 
at whatever the market rate for rent is. This means the community had a large number of renters who are far less price sensitive than those who have, may have been renting before the disaster. This further drives up prices. So this bill will extend, this is in response to um, Representative Brown having multiple meetings with his community and some reports done on the fire by Boulder County about some of the um, issues they saw around the Marshall Fire and how to rebuild and build resiliency moving forward. So what it does, it prevents rent gouging for two years after the natural disaster in order to align with how long insurance companies will pay for rent with the ALE, additional living expense um, provision. It applies only after a governor or presidential declared disaster, provided there is a material decrease in residential housing. It applies only in the designated uh, area designated by the natural disaster declaration. And it caps the increases in rent at 10% annually after the disaster for this, this two-year period. This allowable increase far exceeds the, the CPI, which is um, consumer price index, which is 3.4% currently. The average rent at, um, and the average rate at which, at which rents have increased statewide over the last two years, which is 6.5% in 2022 and 2% percent in 2023. 12% or excuse me if it if for example and it allows people to uh, landlords to raise the rent more than 10% if for example the previous year the market forces let them raise the rent to 12% then they're able to do that for this two year period as well. So we worked very hard to um, coordinate and work with stakeholders to find some compromise. Originally, this was a three-year period, um, but we, I hope that we can count on your support today. People in Boulder County are asking, asking for us to support them as they recover from this disaster and prevent these issues from happening in the future. Senator Pelton B. Oh, Senator, Senadora Gonzalez. Thank you, um, Mr. Chair. I want to speak a little bit about um, the comments um, and the discussion that we heard in committee um, about this policy. Because this, this state has said um, quite clearly And I know, and I've tried, but this, um, this chamber and this General Assembly has said real clearly that we don't want rent control. Cool, got it. I disagree, but I understand and respect that. We're in a different section of statute here, y'all, when we're talking about 1259 and the protections contained herein, or therein. 1259 is about a narrowly tailored timeline. The aftermath of a natural disaster, the aftermath of a disaster that has been declared either by our colleagues at the federal level or right here in our state. We're talking about floods. We're talking about wildfires. We're talking about devastation. And the policy question that we're being asked to grapple with right now is Should landlords be able to charge whatever, whenever, even in the midst of that crisis? 1259 asks us to consider that maybe price gouging, a principle that is well established in other areas of statute, should not be allowed to occur 
in the immediate aftermath of a housing disaster. Okay. An important piece of information that I had not previously been aware of was the fact that, and it was a, it was a very appreciative of the testimony that we heard um, from people who had been directly impacted by the Marshall Fire. That they had been homeowners, lost their homes in the Marshall Fire, and thereafter, while they were waiting for their homes to be um, rebuilt or repaired, their insurance policies were willing to pay 100% of whatever the asking rent would be. Don't we think that in that context, we'd want to place some level of protection so that we don't see our insurance rates continuing to skyrocket? We've had interim committees to discuss the complicated factors that go into the insurance crisis that the, um, uh, that the Marshall Fire and other wildfires across the state laid bare. Do we really wanna say, no, let's not protect the, ten the, the tenants in that immediate aftermath? I'm gonna I'll just start there, as I know that we're going to begin uh, the debate and discussion uh, on this important policy. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair, for your time and consideration. Senator Hawkes Lewis. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Colleagues, many of you know uh, what happened uh, in my first year in representing my district. Um, as a senator, I was the senator in Louisville when the Marshall Fire occurred. Uh, I'll never forget that date for the rest of my life as nor will thousands of folks in Colorado, December 30th. There's a group in Eastern Boulder County, and they're, they're actually their work has now spread to other areas of the state. It's called the East County Housing Opportunity Coalition. They did a very amazing thing. They studied what was going on post-fire, and they helped set up a Facebook page that people could share what they needed. They could share what their family had gone through. They could share that they were desperate for housing. They could share what was happening to them day by day. What we started to notice on that Facebook page is that as families were reaching out to find other places to live, if they had been looking for a property before that, and we had several families, they were growing. They were getting ready to have another kid. They needed an, an office in their home. All of a sudden, all of a sudden, right after the fire, the rents quadrupled, doubled. It was unbelievable what was happening. They had been quoted 2,200 a month. It went to 4,000 a month. They had been quoted 2,500 a month. It went to 5,000 a month. Let me share a story with you. This wasn't just homeowners. This wasn't just apartments. These are families. Kenneth and his wife and their four kids watched their rental home burn to the ground on the news, leaving them feeling hopeless. 
A lot of friends stepped up, their church stepped up and helped them with money and clothing and furniture. They were hoping to stay in the Louisville Superior area, but they couldn't find anything for a family of six. Again, their church, their work, their friends tried to help them. What they found is that the rent that they had been paying doubled, doubled. This family felt hopeless. They ended up having to move completely out of the area. I want to share a story about Leslie. Leslie was one of the local firefighters. After she had been through all of the experience of fighting the fire, the aftermath, trying to work with the insurance company, her settlement, she was a renter, her settlement gave her $2,500. That was supposed to set up her new rent, pay the new deposit. That didn't even cover the rent. This is what was going on post the disaster in Boulder County. But this is not limited. We know, colleagues, this is not limited to the Marshall Fire. Those of you that served during COVID, we saw what happened during COVID. We saw that commodity prices increased. All I have to do is remind us about toilet paper. What about Lysol? What about cleaning materials? We saw that. It was gone from the shelves and the prices doubled. That's what's going on with rent. That's what's going on in these areas post-disaster. And we can do something about it. We can do it for a short amount of time. And we can offer some kind of comfort to these families post-disaster. I know the, the good senator from Alamosa had a fire that took out a lot of family homes not long after the Marshall Fire. Any of us can have a disaster. All it takes is for a block, a community block in your area and the surrounding area, the price can go up. That's what this bill is designed to do. It's to offer, offer a temporary, short, relief period. We're asking for an I vote on House Bill 1259. Senator Pelton B. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So I'd like to go over, I, I heard this in my committee as well, and I appreciate the sponsors and I appreciate all the debate that's been going on. Because, um, you know, in 2013, I was a contractor in Logan County when the floods hit us. Um, I was also a county commissioner in 2017. In March of 2017, brand new commissioner when we had the Logan fires come through and burn 32,000 acres of Logan and Phillips County. Um, I'm, I'm very familiar with disasters. I was also the, the chair of the health department, Northeastern Colorado Health Department during COVID and crisis um, times. So I mean, I'm very familiar with disasters all across the state of Colorado. But I want to go back over what the bill does <clears throat> um, and, and what some of the, the comments that we heard from the people that were the opponents of the bill. So the bill imposes a two-year rent control following a, a declared disaster that impacts housing, rent, uh, which impacts housing. Rent control leads to redu reducing housing supply. It stifles investment in real properties and increases housing shortage in the long term. So what this bill does is it creates a deceptive tra trade practice that begins after a declared disaster resulting in a material loss of housing, implements a two-year rent control of the greater of, the greater of a 10% of rent before the disaster or the percentage increase in the prior year. It also extends to all rental properties in the county or counties listed in, the, in a d disaster declaration. So what the problem with the bill is, is that this bill goes beyond addressing the targeted needs of disaster impact individuals and families. 
The bill imposes rent control across large ge geographic areas for a period of two years at a time when the state seeks to increase housing supplies. Rent control leads to redux reductions in housing um, as owners convert rental units into owner-occupied units, reductions in the overall quality of the available rent rental properties as the fair return on investments in improvements is limited, um, and redu reduction in construction of new rental units as investors are no longer able to recoup their investments. So some of the amendments uh, that we heard, especially from the Apartment Association, was that they would like to see a decreasing, um, the, the, or they'd like to see decreasing the period of a post-disaster rent control to six months instead of two years. The time length mirrors the existing post-disaster price gouging um, statute, limited limiting the applicate uh, the uh, applicable to a person that has lost their home in the de declared disaster and removing rent control dollar amount from the bill while allowing an individual to seek legal remedies by proving the rent is unfair and unconscionable. So with that, Mr. Chair, I'm going to offer an amendment. Feels like there might be an amendment coming to the desk. Oh, there is an amendment at the desk. Mr. Hubler. Will you please read Amendment L008? L008, Amendment Reingress Bill, page 3, line Senator 6. Senator Pelton B. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move L008 to House Bill 1259. To the amendment. So what this amendment does is it decreases the length of rent control following a disaster from two years to six months. And what the amendment is is that it aligns with rent, gou with, uh, aligns rent gouging with the six-month period in the existing post-disaster price gouging statute for goods and services found in CRS 61730, the existing statute applies to essentials including food, medical supplies, transportation, fuel, and building materials. This, this, uh, this amendment is needed at a time when Colorado needs more housing options implemented in a, a two-year rent control after a disaster across a wide geography is um, uh, like an entire county or counties has the opposite effect. And based on research, um, what I've already explained, uh, this, this, this amendment is needed in this bill. So I ask for an I vote on L008. Senator Gonzalez. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Don't go too far, Mr. Senator from Pelton, Peltonia. I have a couple of questions. Um, so if I understand your amendment L008 correctly, you want to you want to amend the engrossed bill page three, line six. Disaster period means the date a disaster declaration begins and continuing for not two years, Six months. Why six months? Senator Pelton B. Um, thank you for the good senator from Denver, because um, it aligns with the statute on 61730 CRS. Senadora Gonzalez. Thank you, um, Mr. Chair. Um, help me better understand what that is. I've tried to be with my statutes, but um, they're so close and yet so far. So um, can you please elucidate for me, Senator from, good Senator from Sterling, thank you. Senator Pelton B. So uh, again, this, this um, statute is the existing statute applies to the essentials, like 61730. Um, like including food, medical supplies, transportation, fuel, and building and materials um, prevents that part from being price gouged. So we're going to add rent to that same statute. Senator Gonzalez. Thank you, um, Mr. Chair. Um, asking ye shall receive 61730. Price gouging during declared disaster prohibited. The gen one, the General Assembly hereby, A, finds and determines that, one, under ordinary conditions, 
The pricing of consumer goods and services generally is best left to the marketplace, except that when a declared disaster results in abnormal disruptions of the market, the public interest requires that any unfair and unconscionable increase in the price of consumer goods or services be discouraged. And two, protecting consumers from price gouging is a vital function of the state's interest in providing for the health, safety, and welfare of the public. And B, declares that existing prohibitions on deceptive or unfair and unconscionable trade practices under this Article I should be clarified to ensure that price gouging has been and remains a violation of this Article I. Two, a person engages in an unfair and unconscionable act or practice when, during a disaster period and within the designated area, the person charges a price so excessive, I'm, I'm using the trick I learned from the good minority leader, as to amount to price gouging in A, the sale or offer for sale of building materials, consumer food items, emergency supplies, fuel, medical supplies, or other necessities, or two, the provision of or offer to provide repair or reconstruction services, transportation, freight or storage services, or services used in an emergency cleanup. Three, a price shall not be considered unreasonably excessive if the seller can prove that, due to the events that gave rise to the disaster declaration, the price charged by the seller is directly attributable to the additional costs imposed by the seller's supplier or suppliers or other direct costs of providing the good or service sold or offered for sale by the seller. Four, this section is unenforceable solely by and at the discretion of the attorney general or the district attorney with jurisdiction over the conduct at issue. There are then dates, I'm sorry, there are then definitions of the building materials, consumer food item, designated area, disaster, disaster declaration, disaster period, emergency supplies, fuel, fuel includes gasoline, diesel fuel, and methyl alcohol. Medical device, medical supplies, necessities, repair or reconstruction services, transportation, freight or storage services. And this was added as a section of statute in 2020. And then thereafter, amended in House Bill 231192. Now, I want to focus, now that I'm familiar with the statute, and now that we're all familiar with the statute, for those of you following along on the interwebs, five, oh, I've learned. Line by line, 18911, it's seared into my memory. Back to the bill, Mr. In indeed, Chair. back to the bill. Thank you. <laughs> In case we need to go to 189111, we've got bigger problems. <laughs> but as we are talking about definitions, this reminds me of the debate that we had in regards to House Bill 20, I want to say it was 1410, where I was asking for a moratorium on evictions. As I recall, it was May or June. I don't really remember when. We had, remember the plastic barriers in between each of our desks? Remember the masks? Remember the fights that we were having? This is before I lost four family members. 
to COVID? This was back in the day when we thought that everything was going to just be a couple, two weeks, and then everything was going to be fine. At the time, I was asking for an extension of the eviction moratorium through the end of the year, December 31, 2020. When I initially proposed that idea, with that ask, because how are you supposed to shelter at home if you no longer have a home? If, we, if you no longer have a home, how are you supposed to keep yourself safe, keep your family safe? You know, when I initially proposed that extension of the eviction moratorium, opponents laughed. <laughs> I'll continue this story shortly. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. I'd like to call Senatorial 5. Senatorial 5 has been granted.
continued discussion on L008 to House Bill 1259. Minority Leader Lundin. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I rise in support of House or um, Amendment 8 to House Bill. Help me out here. Uh, 15 to 1259. 1259. Um, so we've been having an interesting conversation, and I am grateful for the expansiveness of the conversation and, the, quite frankly, the bill sponsor's willingness to make movement in improving this bill. Um, and like so many of the pieces of policy we address here, you can make incremental marginal changes that make incremental marginal changes positively or negatively within a bill. But you are disturbing the status quo, and I, in this particular instance, would be arguing for the status quo ante, not as an anti, but ante is in Latin for before. I think that the circumstance prior to the bill is a better circumstance for the people of Colorado and the big issue that we are dealing with, which is housing affordability in Colorado today. Amendment 8 takes this, you know, it was conceptualized by the bill sponsors to put a three-year um, limitation on the, the, the ability of the marketplace to find stasis, to find normalcy, to find a, a willing buyer and a willing seller coming together, which is how you get more housing, frankly, is by allowing market forces to exist. Um, the bill, as we are debating it, says that two years is the magical disruption of the marketplace. It's okay if we only disrupt the marketplace for two years, says the bill. The conversation now is, well, we're thinking about a year, a year is better, and this amendment is six months. So I argue for the amendment because I think, quite frankly, the time frame should be zero. Let the market forces be the market forces um, and let the pre-existing statutes around um, non-deceptive trade practices, but um, predatory, we'll call it, actions taken by individuals selling and buying in a marketplace uh, influenced by a disaster, um, be what they are controlled by the pre-existing statute. That would be my prior, pr uh, preferred argument. Six, uh, or six months, Amendment 8, brings the bill in alignment with that pre-existing element of the statute in some ways. In other ways, there, is, there are distinctions um, that are meaningful. Um, so I urge your support for Amendment 8, which would bring the limitation down to six months with an understanding that we've broken this conversation loose. There are now a willingness, there's now a willingness to consider the fact that 24 months, 36 months certainly, may not be the right answer. Um, I will continue to advocate for six, um, but I'm grateful that the conversation has been broken loose and we're now having a meaningful dialogue on the length of time, which is the core element of Amendment L008 that I urge your support of. Senator Hawkes Lewis. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Since we're talking about length of time, Colleagues, I just wanted to give the official definition of what these folks are going through, the benefit that they would use, what happens when there's a disaster in your district. What do people do? Well, they reach out to their homeowners or their condominium owners or their renter's insurance policy for their additional living expense, their A-L-E. Guess what the time period is for the ALE? It's two years. It's two years. That's why this amendment doesn't quite get us there. Six months is not long enough. That's why the bill is designed for two years. It's to line it up with the covering folks for what on average insurance companies have said, this is what we should help people with, two years two years for these additional cost of living, two years to find another place to live, two years to figure out how to get your kids to school. That's why we're doing this bill at two years. So on this amendment, which is only six months, we urge a no vote. Senator Janal. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I rise in support of Amendment L008 um, you know, I, I think that, and I understand where the bill sponsors are coming from um, in regards to disasters and, 
trying to help the marshal fire victims um, who my heart goes out to. It is a Boulder-centric bill. Um, I, I have not heard from anyone in my county, in Larimer County, who went through numerous disasters, floods and fires as well, several times over. Um, that hasn't come up. I haven't heard from anyone in Colorado Springs at the Waldo Canyon fire and what they had to put up with and how they rebuilt there. Um, so I'm looking at and, and listening to uh, why six months would be good, uh, and it aligns with what's already in statute. It's going to allow the market to, readjust, uh, to readjust itself within a six month period of time. That seems to be the case in every other situation. Um, and so that's why I believe that uh, two years is way too long, and let's align it with statute that's already there for everything else and go with six months. Senator Pelton B. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I agree with the six months, and, and the reason why I agree with it is like, it, like the good senator from uh, Larimer County said was, you know, it, it's the statute, it's the norm now in statute. Um, when we had the 2013 floods and there was a disaster declaration, you know, we didn't want to see all kinds of um, price gouging and uh, uh, with all of our equipment that we were trying to buy to fix stuff. So it was kind of nice that, that that was not going on. However, um, I understand that the changes, the timelines um, and that sort of thing, I just, I, I just want to make sure that we're not, that, that the market has time to catch up and it's not over a year. So that's my frustration. I just want to make sure we have it, um, that we keep it at six months. So I ask for an I vote on L008. Senator Gardner. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, I, I guess I support this amendment. Um, uh, I will I will vote for it and urge you to vote for it. But you know, how long do you want to hinder the supply of housing when a disaster has caused a shortage in housing? Six months, a year, two years? How how, how long do you want to how long do you want to do that? Because there there's demand. There's demand, and we'll talk about this more, but the reality is that inflated pricing, you know, if, if price gouging was a person, we'd, we'd have a bill, or we'd have a bill to say you can't call it that because to call it that is to put a bad label on a on a poor principle a poor principle of economics that just can't defend itself um, we would have a bill say you can't use the word gouging anymore you know the shorter the better because the demand for housing will be there in a natural disaster for sure. If it's a, a true natural disaster, FEMA is going to be there moving in uh, trailers and even even those shipping containers. You say, well, you can't live in one of those. Well, people, soldiers did in Afghanistan, and it's a roof and so forth. We we'll try to fulfill that, but, you know, the quicker, the quicker we allow the market to respond, the quicker there will be adequate housing to 
meet the demand that is there. So uh, I, I ask you to vote aye on this amendment, um, but do so saying to you, it amends a bill that at, it, that at its core is wrong-headed. Thank you. Are you gonna talk on your own? Senator Cutter. Um, thank you for the good debate. I urge a no vote on amendment L008. We're willing to negotiate, um, but six months is, is arguably too short of a time period we're not dealing with commodities, supply chain issues. We're dealing with people, homes, having a secure and stable place for their family. So I urge an I vote on Amendment L008. A no vote. I, oh, God. Excuse me. A no vote. Sorry. <laughs> uh, Senator Janal had been next. Senator Janal. Thank, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, when uh, we were in a senatorial five about um, L008, I asked, uh, because it seemed like there were a lot of people, and I don't doubt that there were a lot of people that uh, were affected by um, the Marshall Fire, but I was um, given a website called Echo, and it said it had a lot of data in it um, in regards to uh, the people that were displaced and uh, clarifying that the insurance companies couldn't uh, take advantage of the ambiguity um, in habitability. And, and so I looked up the, um, I was looking for this data because, you know, I mean, I think it means a lot if there's a lot of people that are, are being affected. And right now, I don't see any data. I hear, I see stories. I see from ECHO, they asked candidates for mayor of Louisville about their views on affordable housing. They had Lafayette Willoughby's Corner Project that approved uh, uh, some planning. There, there is no data there. Community meetings, no data there. Uh, I just wanted numbers to see how many people were affected by this. We heard two stories up here, um, real life stories, no doubt, uh, about um, folks affected. Uh, there were two families, and my heart goes out to them. But how many people does this really affect as dramatically that, as we're talking about here in this bill? And so that's why um, I, I haven't seen any data yet, and that might help. Senator Cutter. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, thank you to the good senator. I, I just wanted to share some data. Um, in Superior, only 42% of homes, 168 of 395, have been rebuilt currently. In Boulder County, unincorporated Boulder County, only 12%, 19 of 157, have been rebuilt. Prior to the Marshall Fire, a 2,200 square foot home would have rented for an average of $4,532 a month, which is about $2 per square foot, a little more. In contrast, this winter, one Louisville family indicated they were paying $11,000 per month, $11,000 per month for a 22-square-foot 22, 22 home in Louisville. Um, someone else is paying $5,000 a month for a small apartment. A report by the East County Housing Opportunity Coalition found that in the year after the Marshall Fire, Residents, many residents saw their rents increase 30 to 50 percent. This is a group that is tracking data. Many who are renting in the area have now been priced out of the rental market and had to leave. Um, also, it, overall, the fires impacted 6.3 percent of housing stock in Louisville, 12.3 percent in Superior. Senator Gonzalez. Thank you, Madam Chair. Are we still on the amendment? Yes, we are on L008. Thank you for clarifying. Thank you. Well, I want to rise in opposition to L008 because I started telling you all a story immediately prior to the senatorial five that we took where when I was 
launching into my little story to tell you all about the ways in which when I initially was calling for about a six month moratorium, it might have been seven months, I don't remember, it was through, it was May or June of 2020, and I was asking for an eviction moratorium through the end of the year, and opposition stakeholders straight up laughed, and they said, December? That's bonkers. And you know who came in and, and actually extended the eviction moratorium? President Donald Trump. Broken watch is right twice a day, I guess. Um, however, back to this bill and back to 1259 and the amendment that we are now considering. The reason that six months is just simply not long enough is due to part seven, well, is due to 3812702. The limit on frequency of residential rent increases. When you go to that aspect of the statute, 3812702, you see Sub one, notwithstanding any other law in a non-residential tenancy of one month or longer, but less than six months in which there is no written agreement between the landlord and tenant, a landlord may increase the rent only upon at least 21 days notice to the tenant. Two A, notwithstanding any other law in a residential tenancy in which there is no written agreement between the landlord and tenant, a landlord may only may increase the rent only upon at least 60 days written notice to the tenant. B, a landlord may not terminate a residential tenancy in which there is no agreement by serving a tenant with a notice to quit pursuant to 1340-107 with the primary purpose of increasing a tenant's rent in a manner inconsistent with this section. That's 701. Now, 382702, limit on frequency of residential rent increases. This is the important part, friends. One, in, a residential, in residential tenancies, a landlord shall not increase rent more than one time in any 12-month period of consecutive occupancy by the tenant. Regardless of A, whether there's written rental agreement for the tenancy, B, the length of the tenancy, and C, whether the tenant's rental agreement is for a fixed tenancy, a month-to-month -month tenancy, or an indefinite term. So, if the Marshall fire, which took place, I believe, in December, had that tenant who had been living there previously just signed a new lease in, say, November, none of the protections that are offered under a six-month um, protection offered by the good senator from Sterling would apply. For that reason, six months is just incongruent with already existing current statute. I ask for a no vote on the amendment. Minority Leader Lundeen. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Um, the, the bill sponsors have brought this bill using over and over again the word immediate. Immediate means something. It's not three years from now, it's not two years from now, as the bill cur currently says. Um, it's not even a year from now, as um, proposed potential future amendments may be brought. And, and six months is still not immediate. The bill sponsor said, well, housing, that says it has nothing to do with supply chain. <laughs> it has everything to do with supply chain. How do you suppose all the component pieces of a house are assembled but by collection and construction at a specific point in time of all the very many, many elements of housing. And we're talking about a disaster here. A flood has come through. Housing is potentially gone, inaccessible, wiped away, washed away possibly. A fire might have come through. The housing is burned down. So what do we need? Well, we in this modern 
global economy, we need those great big container ships stacked high with great big containers to transit the great big oceans to get to Colorado via truck from a port of entry to bring all of the things that are required to build the housing stock back. It has everything to do with supply chain. And what does this bill do? It says, not in Colorado. Uh, yeah, yeah. Invest your capital elsewhere. Build up the housing stock in Kansas. They're not punishing the people that are building housing stock. Build up the housing stock in Wyoming. They're not punishing the people who are building housing stock. Build it up in Utah, build it up in New Mexico, and extend out to the next round of states beyond that as well. But the bill says, not in Colorado. We've become here in Colorado very comfortable with excessively expensive housing, says this bill. This amendment seeks to draw that down. It simply says six months. You, you, you're representing immediate, and we, those who support Amendment 8, which is a six-month limitation, think six months is a whole lot closer to immediate than is two years. I urge your support of the Amendment 8. The motion is the adoption of Amendment L008. All those in favor say aye. aye. All those opposed, no. The no's have it, and L008 is lost. Senator Pelton B. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So I would like to offer another amendment. There is an amendment. At the desk, Mr. Hubler, will you please read L12? L012, Amendment Rand Gross Bill, page two lines. Senator right. Pelton B. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move L012 to um, House Bill 1259. To the amendment. Thank you. So, what this amendment does is that um, it changes price gouging from deceptive trade practices to unfair or unconscionable act or practice. Um, it also defining rent gouging as unfair and unconscionable practice matches the statutory definition of other post-disaster price gouging goods and services found in section, the same CRS section that we've been talking about. So, um, and it also narrows um, the disaster declaration that it has to specifically declare that a material dis uh, decrease in residential housing units um, the person engages in. So it actually actually has to state in the des in the declaration from the governor's office that that has happened. And um, so I ask for an I vote on L012. Senator Cutter. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And thank you to the good Senator, Senator from Sterling. I, um, this is a compromise and um, I, I'm happy to take L012 today and urge your support. And thank you for the, the work in that. Seeing no further discussion, the motion is the adoption of L12 to House Bill 1259. All those in favor say aye. aye. All, of, aye. all opposed, no. The ayes have it, and Amendment 12 is adopted. Senator Cutter. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I would like to offer. Another amendment? There is an amendment at the desk. Mr. Hubler, will you please read L11? L11, Amendment Rand Gross Bill, page three, line six, strike two years and substitute one year. Senator Cutter. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I move L011 and um, all the, it just, it, this, it says it all. All it does is um, remove two years and substitute one year uh, in an off, uh, attempt to compromise. We originally started at three years, moved it down to two, and now we're, um, we're going to settle on a year. So I urge an I vote. Minority Leader Lundeen. <clears throat> Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, feels a little bit like a Faustian bargain. That's the deal you cut with the devil. Um, my, my answer is status quo ante. Let's just get rid of the bill. 1259 is not beneficial. Going to make housing more expensive in Colorado. 
And uh, one year is better than two years, but it's still not good. Um, so I stand here and say, yeah, I'm, I, I do appreciate it. And as, as we all, like Sherpas, we carry these bills around on our back, and sometimes we become very attached to them as we carry them. Um, and so, so we don't want to change them. And so it's hard for us sometimes to make changes to the bills we've been carrying. Um, I want to acknowledge and thank the sponsor for being willing to make some changes to, to this bill as she, she carries it and then reluctantly say, yeah, still doesn't get me where I need to be to be a yes vote on this bill. I think we'd be better off without it. Um, as to this amendment, this amendment's an improvement, but not nearly enough. So I oppose the amendment because I oppose the bill. The motion is the adoption of L011. All those in favor say aye. aye. All opposed, no. The, the ayes have it, and L011 is adopted. The, the motion is the adoption, Senator Gardner. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Members, um, a, a moment ago, a few minutes ago, maybe a long time ago, um, I came to the well to speak to an amendment, and uh, it may have sounded somewhat ambivalent about that, um, because I was. Because the amendment was just arguing around the margins about this bill. Now, there's, there's a famous line in, uh, in discussing terrorism and other political movements that uh, one person's terrorist is another person's freedom fighter, and you know, that, that's a pretty over-the-top kind of thing, but states kind of a truism, and this, this bill chooses two terms, uh, a response by the market as price gouging. And it caused me to think in a similar fashion, one person's Price gouging is another person's operation of the free market. I think all of us have a, a visceral response in the wake of disasters of any sort when there are people out there taking extreme advantage of the situation and saying, well, um, I have a second generator. I'll, I'll sell it to you for, you know, and I paid $1,200, not a huge generator. I paid $1,200 for it. I'll sell it to you for $5,000. But I, I need electricity. Well, you know, a lot of people without electricity. Um, I'm running both my generators. I'm willing to make a, you know, cut back on what I'm using because I need some, I need some money because I've just had a disaster myself and uh, just like you have and I've got a second generator and I'd like to, I'd like to have some monetary resources to deal with the natural disaster and the bank didn't close and you may have the funds to pay for that. So is that immoral? Should that be illegal? I mean, we're making that decision, and we're making it at 10%. The, the interesting thing about the bill to me, for instance, is what it does about dwellings that aren't on the market. And it doesn't really answer the question of, what would I do now? I, my home. My home has two floors above ground and a finished basement. And I don't, I don't rent any of that space out. Um, don't need to, don't wish to do so. 
But, you know, if I was in a natural disaster area and my house had survived and other people had had worse damage than I had and I'm looking at having to do home repairs and fight with the insurance company and, and do all of those things. Um, and someone, I, you know, and I, I don't already have a family member or, or close friend that I, that's in need of a place, I might consider renting out my basement. Very livable. And how would you determine what the market value is? And, and is renting out my basement, is that a dwelling? It's a piece of a dwelling. I mean, I can see in the housing situation, and let's, let's think of something like happened on Maui. Um, as I understand the damage there, uh, and we have seen this in Colorado, um, the fire damage stops. And the next block over, people were fortunate. They didn't lose their home. But they're in the disaster area. And maybe they have an extra room. How are we going to determine the market on that by VRBO or, or what? And, you know, I'd want more to take someone into my home, but I also would, I'd also be willing to do so if I were paid enough to do so. And that would make that would make a roof, so to speak, available to someone. Uh, and I would be incentivized to do it because someone would have the money to pay me for having someone in my basement that I don't really know. Um, I, I said earlier about the six-month amendment that really what this is about is how long do you not want to increase the supply of what is scarce? How long do you want to put a lid on that and say, well, people, people would bring People would bring this to the market. They would bring housing to the market. They would, they would be doing things that they wouldn't ordinarily do for prices that admittedly are just pretty high. But you're not going to increase the supply. You're not going to have building. In fact, it's sort of unrealistic in reality because when you have true natural disasters and you have a need for housing, people start putting up tar paper. I mean, they need shelter from the elements, and it may not be. Well, it is an ideal. It poses a public health problem if you don't deal with it. That's why, that's why FEMA has all these extraordinary things that they can do uh, to make temporary housing available in the disaster context. But we want people to come to the market and make things available. <clears throat> and if somebody charges, let's put it this way, if someone charges too much, it won't happen. The transaction won't happen. And that will determine what the market is. Now, again, that may make you uncomfortable, and you may say, well, that's, 
immoral. But I, I don't know. I mean, people are making life-saving drugs available to others for exorbitant prices that reflect the true cost of the drug, that reflect what it costs to make that drug. Is that immoral that they do that? You know, just as an example of, of the market, I mean, is it immoral that it costs a lot of money to produce a drug that saves someone's life? And I mean, the, the market is, it, it is amoral, not immoral, amoral. It simply sets transactional prices based on supply and demand. This bill is incredibly well-intentioned, incredibly. But it doesn't really improve the supply of housing in disaster situations. It's an impediment to them. It's an impediment to increasing housing. You say, well, but it should be wrong to do that. Well, I do know that when there are market differentials amongst jurisdictions, um, you see this more on the East Coast where states are closer together and you have differing tax structures on alcohol and tobacco and things like that. People will, people will kind of do extraordinary things. They'll, they'll be in the interstate smuggling operation a little bit uh, because things will move in the market based on price differentials or based upon supply and demand. Members, I'm going to be a no vote on this bill, not because it has a limit of six months or a year or two years, but because it is counterproductive to what needs to happen in situations where there's a natural disaster. And you know, we've got a gout, we've got a price gouging thing in the Deceptive uh, Trade Practices Act as it is, and um, I don't like that one either because it's probably worse than, than this one. Uh, it, it really disincentivizes people to bring products to the market and bring them to the, the disaster area where they're in high demand. It does the same, this bill does the same thing with respect to housing, members. I urge a no vote. Thank you. The motion is the adoption of House Bill 1259. All those in favor say aye. aye. All those opposed, no. no. The ayes have it. House Bill 1259 is adopted. The Senate will stand in a senatorial five.
Senate Bill 106, Senator Zenzinger. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I move Senate Bill 106 and the committee report. To the committee report. In committee, we made a number of amendments that clarified the right to remedy as an option. We rewrote section four dealing with the HOA approval process, and we altered seven section that removed language around a fiduciary duty. The motion, oh, we need to read the title of the bill, my apologies. Mr. Hubler, will you please read the title to Senate Bill 106? Senate Bill 106 by Senator Zunzinger and Coleman and Representative Byrd concerning legal actions based on claim defects in construction projects. I'll just give them my copy. So just for the sake of order, could you please remove the committee report? Senator Zunzinger. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I move Senate Bill 106 and the committee report. The motion is the adoption of the Local Government and Housing Committee report. All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed, no. The ayes have it and the committee report is adopted to the bill. Senator Zenzinger. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Senator Zenzinger. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, members, um, we are very pleased to be able to present to you today uh, Senate Bill 106. Uh, we had a very rigorous uh, debate in our uh, committee of local government and housing and um, I don't know, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, we um, laid over the bill for action only and continued to work with uh, a number of stakeholders on the bill. Uh, we have continued uh, since that time uh, to prepare for you today uh, uh, what we are characterizing as essentially a strike below um, to the bill. Uh, we are in the process of getting uh, some copies that are made up uh, for the benefit of the body. Um, and so while we are waiting for that, uh, we would like to just uh, very quickly talk a little bit about um, some of the progress that we think we have made on the bill in order to um, address uh, concerns that we have heard. Um, so first, um, we uh, have decided uh, to uh, remove uh, a section of the bill known as right to remedy. Um, what this section did uh, was essentially carve out a pathway for uh, homeowners in order to um, choose a route outside of uh, the court proceedings in order to get their, uh, their defect um, addressed. Uh, this would have created some guardrails around that process. Um, uh, we have decided that in uh, being responsive to the um, concerns that were brought up uh, from uh, stakeholder conversations that we've had that this, uh, removing this section of the bill would essentially maintain the status quo, um, but uh, it, it provided or would have provided um, settlement offers or offers to repair claimed defects in the current notice of claim process, uh, but uh, without the proposed conditions that any third party that performs this remedial work is solely responsible for the quality of that work. Um, Several of um, the stakeholders in this process argued that these sections created potential problems for, for homeowners, in particular after the initial repairs are made. And so while we disagreed with that contention, uh, we felt that it was appropriate at this time in order to eliminate those sections of the bill. Uh, those sections of the right to remedy uh, process were uh, sections two, sections three, and section six of the bill. Uh, also, in our discussions with our stakeholders, uh, we heard a lot of concern around issues that had to do with um, the imminent and unreasonable risks in our negligence per se component of the bill. 
And so uh, what we did is uh, we uh, honed in on that particular phrase. Uh, one of the offers uh, that we made in committee was to further define uh, what imminent meant. Uh, we had a very lengthy amendment that was prepared um, that was debated in committee. Uh, we also had an alternative um, uh, amendment uh, that was suggested uh, that defined it differently. Uh, we made a decision at that time as a committee between the two competing uh, definitions just not to move forward with it um, in committee and to uh, continue to work with our stakeholders in order to come up with um, uh, some phrasing and some language that would be more acceptable to everybody uh, concerned. So we did not move forward with uh, trying to uh, hash out or define the word imminent. Um, so. The Senate will stand in Senate Row 5. There is an amendment at the desk. Mr. Hubler, will you please read Amendment L099 to L99. Senator Wunsinger. L99, strike all Senator the government. Senator Oh, thank you very much. I move Amendment L99. L99 is moved. You have explained it. Would you like to continue, have any further discussion? Senator Zenzinger. Yes, thank you so much. So now that we have the amendment moved uh, properly, um, the very first thing that we did is we eliminated the right to remedy sections, which were sections two, three, and six of the bill. In addition to that, uh, we heard concerns that requiring um, uh, imminent and unreasonable um, would uh, be problematic. Um, we heard concerns that requiring issues to be imminent and unreasonable prohibits claims that create serious risks of injury and threats to life, health, and safety and welfare. And so therefore, um, we, uh, as I stated earlier, were prepared to offer an amendment in committee, uh, but we delayed that action so that we could continue hashing out language. What this amendment does is it incorporates language from a Texas statute, a statute that the opponents uh, suggest that we borrow from that helps include code violations that provide a verifiable danger to the occupants of the residential real property, and it further permits a claim for technical code violations which cause an actual failure or lack of capa uh, capability of a building component to perform its intended function or purpose. So uh, we really felt that this was the most reasonable middle ground uh, that we could come up with uh, to date. And then lastly, uh, we addressed HOAs acting in their representative capacity. We removed the fiduciary duty component that was in the former bill in Section 7, and we also limited the language to defenses, taking out specific listing of limitations, claim procedures, and alternative dispute resolution procedures. We believe that this simplifies the statutes, that it can be more adaptable to a variety of factual situations out there. It also essentially allows a judge or an arbitrator to determine if a given issue is a defense to a claim. And again, all this does is make it clear that an HOA bringing claims on behalf of its individual members is subject to the same defenses that those members would be subject to if they brought the claims. Lastly, uh, we have um, uh, done uh, quite a bit of technical uh, work on simplifying the bill, so it is um, in a in a more simplistic format uh, going forward, but we ask for your I vote. Senator Colker. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you to the Senate sponsors uh, of this um, amess, um, amendment. I cannot imagine the work you've gone through to write the original bill, hear from stakeholders, hear from proponents, hear from opponents, and, and then come up with a, another alternative to the original bill. And, and I appreciate the time, uh, uh, giving us time to look at this amendment ahead of time, um, because I do have a number of questions um, when it comes to this amendment. I just want to make sure that I'm getting some clarity on this. Um, I, I, I think, you know, 
so far we're, we're moving in the right direction because I think the original bill uh, as introduced was not consumer friendly. Um, we're getting closer. Um, and, and so some, some of the questions that I have um, comes into the verifiable danger that's listed in this. Um, and I guess these may not be in order of the bill because I'm gonna go back to that. You know, from the, the legal dictionary, verifiable means to make certain, to confirm by formal oath or an affidavit. So if we're going to change from what we had previously to verifiable danger, who verifies? How, who determines that? Because um, danger is also defined as unsafe, hazardous, fraught with risk. Uh, it can be negligence for which a lawsuit can be brought if damages result from creating or leaving unguarded or dangerous condition, which can cause harm to others. So just in that term, and I have a number of other questions, but I'll, I'll, if you have an answer for me, um, I would appreciate it. Um. Senator Zenzinger. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, great question. Um, so uh, the same individual that already um, goes about determining um, whether there is a risk and whether that risk is unreasonable um, is the same individual that would uh, determine whether it is verifiable. Um, and that individual is called a fact finder. Um, there is always a fact finder that is appointed in these types of cases. It could be a jury, it could be a judge, it could be an arbitrator, um, uh, it could be um, separate parties coming to an agreement. So um, uh, that is the way that uh, these things are currently uh, determined and it would continue to um, move forward in that way. Uh, but it is literally the, the term is the fact finder is the individual um, that would make that determination. Senator Colker. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you for that answer. Uh, and that kind of just confirms for me that um, if we're using Texas law or picking pieces of Texas law, um, then we're letting Texas law determine, you know, what we're doing. From my understanding, Texas law is better for consumers and they're still building. There's not a restriction on building. So why not mirror all of Texas law because from that answer, I'm still hearing that we're letting judges decide instead of defining what this is. Um, the other things that I have questions on were lack of capacity, uh, making sure that that lack of capacity, uh, what does that mean versus uh, unreasonable. Um, the original language included unreasonable. So with lack of capacity, does that mean I have a slow toilet? Um, does lack of capacity mean that there's something that's gone wrong, that the toilet won't empty and I have to plunge it every time I use it? You know, who's defining these uh, in specifics? Because I'm thinking if I have to plunge it every time I use it after it's been built, that would be unreasonable for me having to do that. I'm not sure if lack of capacity falls into that. Um, HOAs, still concerned about the formal HOA, you know, 60% vote of the people to take this uh, because not everyone within a building may have a problem, so why would other people vote to take this up? If I have a, a lack of capacity problem with my plumbing because something was installed incorrectly, or because maybe the building, something happened in the pipes, you know, would I need approval from the rest of my HOA to bring this action when it doesn't affect them? So I'm still not in favor of that 60% uh, limit there. Uh, I have a number of other things, but those, those are the things I'll start with. I know a number of other people want to speak on this. Thank you. So the next request I saw in order were Senator Gonzalez, followed by Senator Gardner. There were comments and questions there for the sponsors, so I'll give the sponsors the right of first response. Seeing seen none, Senator Gardner. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, I wanted to uh, perhaps respond to some of the questions uh, raised by the Senator from Centennial. Um, again, I, I had to struggle through law school twice to get this right, so um, hopefully I've got it this time. Um, it is interesting to me, after being here for more years than I care to say now, um, that someone would be raising the question of how to define certain terms and statutes, or who's going to decide. Uh, I mean, I must have, in this chamber alone, with this, this makeup of the General Assembly, the same, uh, have raised this question uh, multiple times, but the answer is always, and it is even when I ask the question, the fact finder will determine. And you say, well, the fact finder. Well, you need to understand, I, I'm not sure everybody here understands how these cases come up. Um, they, they come up because someone has uh, contracted for a construction project, and it might be a homeowner, or it might be uh, but they, they can be commercial. These are not just homeowner projects. Or they've, they've bought a new house. I mean, that's going to be the concern today. They've bought a new house, or, or maybe they contracted for a custom home. Uh, or it could be a set of townhomes, and they are each sold off as built. And then there is something about the structure that the owner says is not okay. Let me just use that, and that's, that's not a legal term. It's just, I'm not okay with this. For instance, a lack of capacity. Well, what could a lack of capacity be? Um, you know, I'm in the general practice of law, and I have some clients who do uh, construction, um, construction contractors, these cases come up. I can think of one where the, the complaint of the owner was that in a particular corner of the building, there was a room, it was a bedroom, and the air conditioning was inadequate there because the building, the, the room got excessively hot. Now, it was a south-facing room in the corner with a fair amount of glass. And the question was, was there sufficient capacity uh, in the HVAC, that's heating, ventilation, and air conditioning, the air conditioner, was there, was there sufficient capacity to cool that room? And it becomes a subject of dispute, but how do you know? Uh, just because the room's hot? Well, it could be that, as was the case here, that the construction contractor put in the system that was called for by the, by the plans. They did what they were asked to do. And so you get this question of, well, it won't cool the room. And, and by the way, can you rebalance the air? And can you do things about that that, that make that possible to do? Um, so I can't. There's a very unique problem. I, I can say it's a lack of capacity problem, but I don't, um, I don't want to put in statute what the airflow ought to be. That's a matter of 
architects, and HVAC contractors and others who have expert knowledge of these things to testify to the fact finder who might be, it might be a trial to a judge because the parties agree to that. Because trying to explain to, in a civil case, six people good and true, all of the details of a large construction project is a bit of a daunting task. And the parties may think it's in both of their interests not to be trying to do that, so they take the matter to a judge. But you, you are entitled to a jury in, in uh, civil cases in Colorado if you ask for it and you pay your jury fee and all. So it could be a group of six people who hear all of that testimony and try to stay awake and then make a decision about whether as a building and engineering matter that contractor had provided or that developer, the builder, had provided a system of sufficient capacity for the construction. Another lack of capacity problem could be inadequate electricity. Uh, we, we have electricians among us who might be qualified, might be qualified at, at a trial in this matter to testify whether that was sufficient for the load. I don't even have the terms of art all down, but for the load for that particular home or building or, or things. A lack of capacity. You would have to have testimony from someone who actually knew about those systems to know whether there was a lack of capacity. So lack of capacity is more of a conceptual legal term in the same way that reasonable and unreasonable are. Um, that fact finders have to determine based upon the evidence. And the evidence consists of someone coming and saying there's a problem and what it's like, and others coming and saying, well, the, the, the problem exists, problem exists because, and there may be disagreements about it, but guess what? All disputes have disagreements about the facts. So we can never, never resolve all of that stuff. So terms like verifiable danger, well, we could, we could seek to have a legal definition of that, and I would invite someone, if they think there ought to be one, sit down with a drafter and try to figure out what that is. But verifiable has its common meaning and danger has its common meaning. So, so many of these terms, when you say, I have concern about the term, those books back there are filled with terms and filled with reasonable and unreasonable, verifiable, substantial. And it's up to fact finders to make those determinations. Senator Zenzinger. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, members, I just want to take us back to um, the point of this section, uh, because I think maybe um, it was lost somehow, probably because I didn't explain it correctly. Um, so what we're trying to do here is we're trying to parse out uh, what are claims and what are technical code violations uh, that should not be counted as claims and why. If you have uh, any kind of defect that results in uh, bodily injury, you have a claim. If you have any kind of uh, construction defect that uh, results in wrongful death, you have a claim. If you have any kind of defect where there is damage, you have a claim. If you have any uh, defect that, um, uh, you know, in which there is damage, 
or there is a potential for, for danger if it's not functioning well, you have a claim. All of those instances, you already have a claim, and we would want you to have a claim because it's really important that if you have a defect that is uh, non-performing, that is damaged, that um, could produce a risk to you or any of those things, then it deserves to be fixed. And we want that, and that is what happens in this bill. What we are trying to do in this section is parse out those claims that are performing. There is no visible damage. There is no uh, risk, harm, danger. None of that exists. It is a performing code violation. And what we are trying to do in this bill is to say that should you be able to stack those performing code violations on top of other violations. And what we are saying is no. If it is performing, if it's not resulting in any damage, if it is not resulting in any danger, it is, uh, you wouldn't even know that it is there, then why are we stacking them on top of real claims? This bill does not prevent any claims from coming forward if there is damage. So in some of the examples that were brought up earlier where there was um, damage that was cited, you already have a claim. It's not, it's not even a question. You already have a claim. If it is not performing and you have uh, any of these conditions, you already have a claim. If it is not performing, you have a claim already. We're trying to get at those that are performing and it hasn't resulted in any damage it hasn't resulted in any injury. It's not going to result in any damage, and it's not going to result in any injury. It's a technical performing violation, and we're trying to separate those out from all the others. Because right now in our statutes, they're all treated the same way, and we don't believe that that is um, uh, a good thing. It's an expensive thing quite frankly, to treat all claims the same. So that's the difference. The language that we uh, use in the Strike Below Amendment was suggested to us by the opponents. Uh, they directed, it, uh, directed us to that area, um, so we, trying to be good partners, uh, looked at that area of statute and said, yeah, that sounds good. Um, and the reason was we were trying to define a term that seemed a little loose and it was better to um, hone in on more specific language. So verifiable danger is more specific. There's no ambiguity there. If there is ambiguity, it would be uh, determined by a fact finder. So it would eliminate the ambiguity. Uh, this uh, lets everybody involved know on uh, very certain terms by using very precise language so that there is uh, no question as to uh, what we are trying to do. So I uh, just wanted to take us back to uh, what this section does. Um, again, uh, in this Strike Below Amendment that we are discussing right now today, uh, we are trying to hone in on technical code issues as claims. So the bill before you right now with this amendment says that performing, so it means they're performing, they're working, code violations that do not cause damage, so there's no damage present, should no longer be claims. Uh, the bill as it stands right now in this amendment does not bar any claim, none. We are not saying that you cannot go uh, and, and have a claim if there is damage. If you have damage, you have a claim. If you have a loss of use, you have a claim. If you have personal injury, you have a claim. 
If you have a building component that is not capable of performing its intended function, you have a claim. If you have a verifiable danger to the occupants, you have a claim. This bill only applies where none of those things are present, none of them. And we ask for your support for the Strike Below Amendment. Thank you. Senator Gonzalez. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, let me start off by saying that I am appreciative of L99 because it struck and abandoned several of the sections that caused great concern and consternation during our committee hearing and during our amendment phase. Um, I will say, and I wanna focus in and hone in on section three of L99, which begins at page three, line 11. And I wanna hone in specifically to page three, line 25, which is 1320.804 sub 1D. I wanna start off by going back to the introduced version of 24106 and that same in the introduced bill, page nine, line 24. In the introduced version, the language there was an imminent and unreasonable risk of bodily injury or death to or an imminent and unreasonable threat to the life, health, or safety of the occupants of the residential real property. It's the introduced version. L99 at page three, line 25, strikes a risk of bodily injury or death to or a threat to the life, health, or safety of and replaces that language with verifiable danger to the occupants of the residential real property or sub E, an actual failure or lack of capacity of a building component to perform the intended function or purpose of the building component. I wanna understand, and this is a question to the sponsors, why strike the language that currently exists? Why strike a threat to the health, life, or safety? Senator Coleman. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much, the good senator. Other senator from Denver, we get a chance to share the city. Uh, the question is, if you look at L99, line 25D, a risk of bodily injury or death, which is also included in C, which is already in statute, the change in the question is, or a threat to life, health, or safety of. In stakeholding conversations, there was a concern that you should not have to determine whether or not there was a threat to your life, health, or safety in order, and whether or not that was an imminent, at the time, threat to life, health, or safety, in order for you to be able to file a claim. So in that conversation, we heard all conversation, all discussion, and said, give us additional language you think that makes sense. Now, I wanna also be very clear that there's three conversations happening regarding this bill. The first conversation that happened regarding this bill is amongst us as colleagues. The second part of the conversation is happening as part of this bill is with the lobby and the clients they represent. And the third part of the conversation that happens with this bill is legal representation. People who actually litigate or arbitrate 
decisions based on these claims. So we asked for their professional opinion because the, the concern with this bill in its entirety is when decisions are made in court, whether or not there is actual determination from one side or the other for a finder of fact, which could be a judge, to determine whether or not you have a claim. And so for us, we heard that imminent was not clear, so we got rid of imminent. And for us, our legal representation on both sides got together and said, let's reference Texas statute. And let's not say a threat to life, health, or safety of, because you shouldn't have to determine whether or not that's the case in order to file a claim for a defect. We agreed. And so that is the reason why we went with A, B, and C, which again, lines 22 through 24, actual damage, actual loss, including bodily injury or wrongful death. But the threat to life, health, or safety, that was something that we said, we hear you. So we will remove this, because I'm not a lawyer. And if I'm in court, and I'm here to determine or make a case to a judge or whoever um, that this should be a claim that we accept or it's a claim that we shouldn't. I don't argue those. So I went with what all of us collectively determined was a good way of describing why this would be a claim that is performing and therefore not performing and therefore you should be able to file a claim. For that reason, we went with the language that still includes risk of bodily injury or death, but remove threat to life, health, safety of. Senator Gonzalez. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. And thank you uh, to the Senator from Northeast Denver for the response. Why? I appreciate the conversation and the, th the layers of stakeholders that are engaged in this work. I'd like to acknowledge that there are subject matter experts. There are, there's certainly a whole bunch of folks floating outside in that lobby right now. And this is a policy that impacts all of us. Can you help point me to committee testimony that referenced the fact that uh, a threat to the life, health, and safety should be struck? Seeing no further discussion, Sarah Gonzalez. I guess I'll take that as there wasn't com committee testimony asking that the language be struck. Senator Coleman. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. There was committee testimony. And in that committee testimony, a part of the decision that was made in addition with us having conversations with the legal representation on both sides, which is not necessarily uh, reflective of the entire collective decision. It may have been a recommendation from legal on the opposite side. And in these conversations, including conversation and testimony, we take all of that information and we determine whether or not we should use certain language in the statute. So what we did hear from opposition is that we want to figure out a way to make it so that there's a greater chance of you filing the claim and being able to move forward with that claim versus not. And so if, to our constituents, our individuals we represent, you have to feel as if or prove that there's a threat to life, health, or safety, 
in order for you to be able to file a claim, which is one of the, issue, one of the particular causes that is listed here in Section 3 of the, of the, um, of the amendment of L99, strike below, then there's probably a chance that you won't. Because what does that even mean? So from testimony, from conversations, stakeholding, and talking amongst ourselves, we determined, which again was initially a recommendation of legal on the opposite side that does not represent their entire coalition, but at least was in conversation with their legal person and ours, that it was best to remove that language so that it increased the opportunity for a homeowner to have the right to file a claim to fix a defect. Senator Gonzalez. Thank you. Help me understand, then, an example that would not present a threat to the life, health, or safety, but would present verifiable danger to the occupants of the residential real property. Help me understand what type, give me an example, of what type of claim we're talking about here. Senator Coleman. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. So, the question is, is give you an example of something that could be classified as verifiable danger. So, for me, personally, if I found out that I had a leaky roof on my home, that starts off as a leak, leaf, and baby's making joyful noise in the chamber. Only oh, no, it could stay. It's <laughs> fine. That, if for whatever reason, that could cause a, a, a danger where the roof could fall in, something could cave in. I should be able to make that claim because I believe, and even with the claim, with the fact, finder of fact, that that could turn into something worse. For us, we not only wanted it to be verifiable danger, but we also made it, if you look in line 28E of our amendment, an actual failure. Because it doesn't necessarily have to be danger, but it could be something that is an actual failure. And in that same example, I imagine that if a roof has a leak, it wasn't created to leak that way when it was built. So we wanted to make sure that again, if you don't feel like something's verifiable danger, that's not the only reason. And it doesn't have to be 10 reasons as to why you can file the claim. It says, the claim may be asserted if the failure in causes, if the failure causes one or more of the following. And so for us, it could be verifiable danger. But for us, it could also be actual failure, which is clear and evident if it is not performing the way that it was intended to as it was built. Just for an example. Senator Cutter. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I would like to offer a substitute for L099, L012. Substitute amendment. There is an amendment, a substitute yeah. amendment at the desk. Will the uh, clerk please read L0, L102. L102, strike Senator over Cutter. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd like to move L102. So moved to the amendment. So in L099, we remove the requirement that a threat to health, life, or safety must be imminent or unreasonable. And the verifiable definition uh, that we've been talking about uh, would, here's an, it, it, unreasonable guards against some of the, the holes we see in the, um, in the word verifiable. For example, sheer walls protecting against strong winds like the wind that we just had. If the walls didn't fail during the recent winds, builders could argue that the threat isn't verifiable because there were strong winds and the house didn't fall down. 
but shear walls are designed to withstand winds at certain speeds, and the recent winds may not have exceeded those speeds. So um, that's why certain speeds would still create an unreasonable threat, even if the threat was not verified by the recent windstorm, but would fail if the winds were higher. So in L012, we strike verifiable danger to the occupants and uh, replace it with an unreasonable risk of bodily injury or death to, or a threat to the life, health, or safety of the occupants of the, resident, of the real property. We also ensure that damage does not have to have occurred in order to bring a claim. So page three strikes lines 27 through 29 and replaces it with an unreasonable reduction in the capability of or an actual failure of a building component to perform an intended function or purpose. We also ensure that breach of contract claims and warranty claims are protected. Um, L0, or Senate Bill 106 will apply the standards for negligence to all claims. And we're really concerned about having this expansion cover the breach of contract claims and warranty claims. So page three, line 36 strikes claims including, and after express contract claims, add or claims to that. Then lastly, we ensure homeowners and HOAs do not have to each file separate notices of claim and the developers may not require steps and hurdles beyond current law for homeowners to pursue legal action. Page four, line 19, um, after claim adds nothing in this section shall be construed to prohibit an association from asserting claims on behalf of two or more unit owners through a single action. So, and we ask for your support. Senator Hawkins Lewis. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, let's make this real. My district, uh, three builders in Erie, are the epicenter of what this bill is about. If we don't fix this bill, if we don't fix this, if this amendment, 102, if we don't adopt 102, let's make it real in what would actually happen. So my constituent, Jennifer Miller, reached out to describe her nightmare situation. So their house, their dream house, was being built with their design and their construction. And a lot of things happened during that process. And I'm sure as the debate goes forward today, I'll get to share some of those. They actually had, this is just one, but they had a soil issue that was going on. And their foundation was not strong enough. Now, why do we want Amendment 102? What, what would that do for Jennifer Miller? What would that do for my Erie constituents? Right now, in the language that is being proposed by the, all those folks out in the lobby, is they want verifiable danger, right? But what we need is we need to think about the risk of bodily injury or death or threat to life. Why? Because of what we just saw this past weekend. I don't know how many of you had their po your power cut off without any warning, but I was one of those. I didn't get power back from XL until Sunday night. Well, that's because of supposedly the winds. The problem is, if they have a defective wind shear design and the walls can't, re re uh, can't withstand the, re the speed of the wind, then they may not, it may not happen right away. The house may not fall right away. The walls may not crack right away. However, these folks, are they're out of luck. They're out of luck. The language will not allow them to seek remedy. That's why we need this language about let's reduce, let's keep in mind, let's think about the risk to bodily injury and death. Let's not get hung up on the words that will keep these folks from seeking remedy on these construction defects. Let's not get hung up on we have to have verifiable danger. Let's be open to the language that the lawyers are telling us that we need to protect our constituents. Please vote aye on Amendment 102. 
Senator Coleman. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. I want to say thank you to our colleagues for bringing this substitute amendment. What I would say is, going back to the language that we have on L99, lines 25 through 27, what we've asked for is verifiable danger. What this amendment, this additional amendment is asking for is to substitute that with unreasonable risk. What we've asked for is an actual failure. And what's being asked of us is unreasonable reduction in capability. The main reason why, there's a couple of reasons why we went with this language. We actually agreed with opposition's legal advisement, although that was not what they ultimately agreed to as a collective, that we should go with this language, the verifiable danger and the actual failure, because we wanted it to be a matter of fact, that there is something going on that you as a homeowner feel like you need to be able to file a claim on. And uh, I want to say thank you to the good senator from Longmont uh, for representing her constituents well and being able to share an issue that has happened in her district, which I respect and I appreciate. And my concern, my question is, if I was in their position, would I be able to say my home as is currently constructed within the statute of limitation, this timeline we have to be able to make a decision about whether or not we can file a claim. Is it performing the way that it was intended, function or purpose of the building component? They clearly don't believe that it is. That is why there's a concern. And for that reason, guess what? They can still file a claim. Fully agree with that. Again, the reason why we decided Back to the other concern that was brought up was a risk of bodily injury or death, which we kept, but a threat to life, health, or safety of, is we didn't want individuals to feel like if they didn't feel it was that extreme, but there was still verifiable danger, they would not be discouraged in filing a claim, which ultimately is the goal in protecting the consumer, protecting the homeowner to be able to file a claim for a defect. There's additional language that was referenced. Um, that was referenced regarding the new section four, old section seven, which is HOAs acting in their representative capacity. So we actually left this language, if you look at L99, lines one through five on page four, and it actually starts on the page before that, exactly the way it came pre amended out of committee. If you look at the subsequent or the substitute amendment, it adds language on that amendment, lines 6 through 15. And ultimately what it says is this subsection does not prohibit an association from asserting claims on behalf of two or more union orders through a single action. Any provision in law, contract, associations, governing documents is void as against public policy if the provision applies to a common interest community and contains construction defect preclaims that are more onerous than those contained in this Article 33.3 or Part 8 of Article 20 of Title 13. We had a conversation with opposition. We discussed that additional language. And Ultimately, we reiterated that we think the language would not require them to bring claims on behalf of individuals being different than individual suits. Our goal, our goal is for every single individual, as it was stated in the first part of this amendment that we provided and they also kept, that a unit owner is subject to each defense that the unit owner would be subject to if the unit owner had brought the claim. We want to be clear that you can still have a defect addressed in an HOA association owned property in the same claim. You do not have to file multiple claims on every single individual unit. And for that purpose, we felt that the additional language at the end of the new section four, old section seven, was language that we cannot accept. 
We believe that L-102 is an amendment we cannot support. We're asking a no for L-102, and again, a yes on L-99 and strike below. Senator Coker. Thank you, Mr. Chair. You know, I just did a quick look through both of these, and um, seeing that they're identical up to page three, it looks like. Um, and the section that I was actually really concerned about, which is section three, lines 25 and uh, through 29 through 30. Um, the new bill or the new amendment replaces verifiable danger with an unreasonable risk and it replaces a, an actual failure or lack of capacity. So it replaces lack of capacity with an unreasonable reduction in the capability. The rest of them are the same. And for me, I think using, from what I heard from uh, the Senator from Colorado Springs, unreasonable is a better terminology since it's being used so many other places. So I, on that part alone, I am good with, because um, that's the, the part that's most concerning to me. So I would be in support of this. Senator Gonzalez. Thank you, Mr. Chair. You know, back in 2017, when Sadara was, was most recently updated, we had, I remember, because I had just that summer, that late summer, decided to um, run for office. I remember the ways that all of these big conversations around the need for construction de defect reform were brought forward and that that was going to solve the housing crisis. Fast forward to 2024. SB 106 as the introduced version. This is a perfect product. Then we see a bunch of amendments made to it with, and now we're being asked to consider L99, which is probably a repair to the perfect original bill. And now we're being asked to consider L102. There's probably a construction defect joke in there somewhere. I'm just not smart enough to make it. Lots of remedies, lots of, lots of disagreement and debate around what actual risk looks like and the language around that. What I want to zoom back out and focus on, because we'll have conversation, I'm sure, about the black letters on the white paper of 102. But what I do want to state by rising in support of this amendment is that you pass this amendment The opposition goes to neutral. The debate on this bill ends, and we can get on with our lives, with the rest of our session, and know that we have reduced litigation and also protected 
the single most important investment that most Coloradans will ever make in their lives, their homes. Or we can sit here and quibble about words for the next few hours or days. And I think that it's a worthwhile and important discussion for us to, to consider. And I'm sorry, but for the folks who think that we ought to prioritize the developers over the homeowners, I don't think that that's a, that's not a calculation that I would make. And it's not one that I think anybody in this chamber would make. Question is how do we balance? the two interests. We hear day in and day out, every single poll, where Coloradans are, are invited to share their opinions and perspectives on what the most important prior, priorities are facing this state. And time and time again, we hear address the housing crisis, address the housing crisis. L-102 addresses the housing crisis by both ensuring that look, in committee, we had this big discussion about, well, we want to avoid litigation if we're talking about, you know, three quarter inch screws being used instead of uh, five eighths inch quarter screws. That's unnecessary litigation. Sure, cool, great, agree, fine. However, right now, We're having to debate about whether we should prioritize verifiable danger to the occupants of a residential real property or an unreasonable risk of bodily injury or death to or a threat to the life, health, or safety of the occupants of a residential real property. or an unreasonable reduction in the capability of, or an actual failure of, a building component to perform an intended function or purpose. How do we balance those important and competing interests of builders and developers versus homeowners. On balance, after digging in deeply to this policy, after listening closely to the debate, after reading with interest the amendments that had been proposed in committee, after reading closely L99, the strike below amendment that is now presented to us here. And now also reading closely, L102, the substitute, strike below. I believe that at the end of the day, 102 strikes the right balance to both reduce 
unnecessary and unneeded litigation, and also protecting Coloradans. And the most significant of investment the vast majority of Coloradans will ever make in their lives, their home. I ask for an I vote on L-102. Senator Coleman, on whether L-102 presents a verifiable danger or an unreasonable risk. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I ask for a no vote on L-102. Seeing no further discussion, the question before us is the adoption of L-102. All those in favor say aye. Aye. I All those opposed? No. The noes have it. L0, L102 is lost. Senator Coleman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. We renew our motion to uh, vote in support of L99. Question is the adoption of L099. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed? No. The ayes have it. L099 is adopted. Is there any further discussion? Senator Marchman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Given uh, the changes that have occurred with the adoption of L099, we feel like the strike below amendment goes beyond what was covered in the fiscal. So we would ask for um, a re uh, a re-reflected fiscal note. Um, so we've got this form. Revise. Senatorial five has been requested. Revised. And will be granted over here.
And we're back. Senator Marchman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And we did reach out to the fiscal analyst who says there is no change in the fiscal analysis. The reason we were wondering is we know that school districts and higher ed and all of those types of um, construction projects are going on and could be impacted by construction defect. So I just want to explain my reasoning for having brought forth that. Uh, but we will not be getting a revised fiscal on, uh, on this amendment. Thank you, Senator Marsh. But just to be clear, uh, there is an, a, a revised fiscal note is on its way. Okay. The fiscal note just does not show a change in the dollar amount on the bill. There is no cost uh, change for the fiscal note. An update in the summary to the fiscal note. Yeah, we, it'll be here in a couple of minutes and you'll see it soon. All right, thank you very much. Senator Gonzalez. Well, it's curious because there was an amendment that was made to the original bill in, in committee to exempt local governments that is now not reflected in L99 which means that local governments would be impacted by the policy changes reflected in L99. And I also assume that that would then extend to school districts, that that would in, uh, extend to um, state-owned property. I would be curious to understand because a week ago, we had a quite lengthy debate here about urgently needed, urgently needed capital construction projects. And I would be curious to know and better understand, as a policymaker, whether our state architect has been able to assess and verify whether the construction process, uh, the construction projects that are currently being considered by our Capital Development Committee stem from a construction defect or not. But they weren't cons consulted, as I understand it, in the original or now revised fiscal note and its analysis. So I'd like to better understand that process. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Senator Bridges. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, we will be getting a fiscal note with a new description in it shortly. I did just want to point out, though, that increased costs to local governments, to school districts, um, to institutions of higher education do not change the general fund impact of fiscal notes. Uh, it does not change what it is that the Appropriations Committee has to um, allocate towards a bill. So even if those changes are caused by the strike below, that would not change the dollar amount reflected in a fiscal note. Just wanted to make sure that was just a, a sort of a, a technical explanation, not weighing in one way or another, but again, that new fiscal note should be up here momentarily. Minority Leader Lundy. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Um, a couple of thoughts. One, I, I point out the logical fallacy. Just because we wrote something once where we thought that, uh, you know, we, we might want to put into statute that local governments aren't affected doesn't mean that the statute or the exemption was actually required. It's possible that we just, we, we do this all the time. We write down things and we, we say things that have no effect. Uh, it's very possible that the prior statement was an unnecessary statement, it's logical fallacy number one. Second element is, as I read 99 and understand the process, it's very likely that if we are in fact having the positive impact on um, development and construction that we potentially would have, we would have the effect of reducing insurance rates across all types of construction and therefore lowering costs. So the actual cost to public education, higher education, in fact very p potentially could be less by virtue of the passage of uh, 
Senate Bill 106 as amended by 99. So I, I would argue that it's potentially beneficial, might even if you had what I'm always asking for, a dynamic fiscal note that really gets all the answers to all the questions inside government and in the real economy. I think this is a positive effect, net effect across all of that, the aspects of, of government as well as the real economy. Senator Coleman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I ask for an I vote on L99. On the amendment or the bill? On the bill. Thank you, Senator Coleman. The question before us is the adoption of Senate Bill 106. Is there any further discussion? Oh. Senator Cutter. No. Yes. Senator Cutter to SB 106. There is an amendment at the desk. Will the clerk please read L103? L103, amend the Senator Cutter. Amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move Senate, uh, Amendment 1 L103 to Senate Bill 24106. To the amendment. So, um, in, because the, the alternative amendment we proposed did not pass, we have proposed in this amendment just striking the verifiable danger to occupants of residential real property and replacing it with an unreasonable risk of bodily injury or death to or a threat to the life, health, or safety of the occupants. And we are ensuring that damage does not have to have occurred in order to bring a claim. Senator Zenzinger. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, members, I would ask for a no vote on the amendment. Um, this is just uh, plucking out language from the uh, amendment that we uh, just um, voted no on. Um, and the issue that we have is that uh, if you have a performing code violation that doesn't cause damage, um, should those claims be um, move forward? Uh, we continue to disagree with the, de the desire to preserve a breach of contract claim based on violations of building codes, manufacturer instructions, or industry standards where there is no damage, where there is no loss of use, where there is no bodily injury, where there is no safety risk to homeowners, and where there is no failure or anticipated failure to perform as intended. And the reason for that is, is that homeowners, if you'll recall, do not usually elect to repair code violations that are performing. If they're working, do they get repaired? Along those lines, I think it's also really important to note that Colorado case law has long held that a party attempting to recover on a claim for breach of contract must prove damages to the plaintiff. The language that we have in the bill creates more certainty for that process. It aids homeowners in making their claim. Inserting this language by using the word unreasonable is instead of verifiable, you now have opened up a loophole, inserted ambiguous language into the process again, and that's the very problem that we are trying to solve for. We're trying to get away from ambiguous language. We're trying to get to succinct language. So, for the very reasons uh, that we requested a no vote on the amendment uh, prior, we would ask for a no vote on this as well, because this is the exact same language that was in that prior language that we have already spoken to. Thank you. Senator Hawkes Lewis. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, um, as I stand here and look at this amendment, it solves the problem that my constituents, the Millers, and I'm pausing because I have to, the um, Paytons, and I'm trying to think of all the folks in my district who have reached out to me from Erie that have had to deal 
with these words that we are getting ready to put into this bill. I'm a pharmacist, the good senator from Arvada is a teacher, the other bill sponsor is an amazing senator, <laughs> thank you. We, we are all struggling with these words because it's the courts, it's the lawyers that will take what we do and decide the fate of the Millers and the Paytons and the folks that have to deal with these construction defects. So let me just read you something short that we got from the lawyers that have to defend this, use this language in court when the homeowners are looking for remedy. Verifiable means true, truth, under oath, confirmed. That's a higher bar. That is a higher bar. If we say, un, if we use the words unreasonable from Amendment 103, which is what we are asking for your yes vote, if we use this amendment, then we have a better bar that our homeowners can receive remedy with. Unreasonable danger threat is what a reasonable person thinks an owner shouldn't have to accept. That's what we're asking in this amendment, folks. We are trying to make sure that if walls are cracking, if doors won't close, if the foundation and the landscape weren't prob prob properly placed, that we have not created too high of a bar for these homeowners. Please support Amendment 103. Senator Zenzinger. Thank you. Um, for the sponsors of the amendment, who gets to determine unreasonable? I'll, I'll repeat my question. For the authors of the amendment, who determines unreasonable? Senator Kolker. Well, I'm not an author, but I will speak in favor of this amendment. Um, from previous comments and what I heard again from the good senator from Colorado Springs, unreasonable is used all over our statutes. Um, and I would just say who determines everything else? It's, it, it would fall in the same line because it's not um, detailed for verifiable danger. It's not detailed for lack of capacity. It's, it's, it's the same thing. So I would say it's going to be the same people who are going to determine unreasonable as it is with verifiable danger and lack of capacity, because those aren't spelled out in this bill either. Um, and this amendment actually, unreasonable risk, unreasonable reduction in the capability is clearer to me than lack of capacity. Again, capability and capacity are two different things, especially when I'm thinking of uh, plumbing, for instance. Is it capable or is there a capacity limit? So this gets me to a yes on the bill, just this amendment right here. Um, an unreasonable risk of bodily injury and an unreasonable reduction in the capability. Um, so I, I urge an I vote for this amendment. Senator Coleman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Once again, we urge a no vote on 103. The motion, Sen Senator Gonzalez. A Thank division you. was called, that is, that is true, so we will... We'll no, pause. the motion on the floor, and I raise my hand to speak to the amendment. Please. Senator Gonzalez. Thank you. Mr. Chair, to respond directly to the question from the good senator from Northeast Denver, the fact finder that... Um, I that the good senator from Arvada asked of the amendment sponsors. I, my apologies, my apologies, thank you. Um, the question was, well, who would determine uh, whether, the, the, um, whether there was a, an unreasonable or a verifiable, right? That's the policy question that, we're, that um, the good senator from Arvada asked us to respond to. It's the same fact finder. The, qu 
question that we're grappling with is what is the evidentiary standard that said fact finder should use in court or in arbitration or mediation or in whatever process under which these processes play out. Verifiable danger requires experts, requires testing, is expensive, And in this affordable housing crisis, where folks are scrimping and scra saving, trying to stretch a dollar out of 15 cents, and for the precious few who are actually able and lucky enough to buy a house, only to find that there's a defect in their home, You raise the issue to the builder, you find yourself in court, and now you have to satisfy a threshold that the problem is substantive enough that you gotta scrimp and scrape, save to hire an expert? That's the policy question that we're being asked to consider and grapple with right now. I support the amendment on the table right now because the reasonableness standard is basic common sense, y'all. Would a common person find it reasonable or unreasonable? And if this bill is ultimately about trying to save people money whether they be a homeowner or a developer, wouldn't you want a standard that a fact finder uses to just be based on common sense? One could hope. I asked for an I vote on L103, I believe and thank the good senator from Aurora for the, or from Arvada for the question. The motion is the adopt, division has been requested.
a division has been requested. All those in the chamber not entitled to vote, please be seated. The motion is the adoption of L103. All those in favor, please stand. The chair is not in doubt. We do, we do, oh, all those, sorry, please be seated. All those opposed, please stand. The, the chair is not in doubt. L103 is lost. <laughs> to the bill. I renew my motion uh, in favor of 106. Thank you. Senator Cutter. Sitting. <laughs> There is an amendment. There's an amendment at the desk. Mr. Hubler, will you please read L104? L104, amend the Senator Floor Amendment. Senator, Senator Cutter. L99. Senator Cutter. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move um, amendment. Uh, L0, L104 to Senate Bill 106. <laughs> to the amendment. So um, what this does is it maintains the risk of bodily injury or death to or a threat to health, life, or safety as a reason for a possible claim. It strikes verifiable danger to the occupants of residential real property and replaces with unreasonable risk of bodily injury or death to or a threat to the life, health, or safety of the occupants of residential property. Senator Coleman. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. And um, I wanna say thank you for this amendment. This amendment addresses, once again, what is on page three of um, the strike below that we presented today. Um, it is dealing with um, lines 25 uh, through um, 27, and again, dealing with unreasonable risk uh, versus verifiable danger, which we've already discussed. Um, if there's further discussion, great, but this is something that we've already talked about. I'm asking for a no vote. The Minority Leader Lundin. <laughs> the motion is the adoption of Amendment L-104. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed, no. no. The no's have it, and L-104 is lost. Senator Marchman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. We're on the bill, right? We are. OK, great. Um, so when we adopted um, the strike below amendment, there's a section that is problematic for me as a homeowner. Um, there's a section that says um, an actual failure or lack of capability of a building component to perform its intended function or purpose is one of the reasons a claim can be brought. But unfortunately, the language requires damage to actually be done. So I've owned two homes in Colorado and I noticed that we have a lot of uh, foundations that settle. And sometimes when we have that settling foundation, it can cause additional construction issues if it keeps going and going and going. And so what this amendment, oh. There is an amendment at the desk. 
Mr. Hubler, will you please read L105? L105, amendment. Senator Marchman. Thank you. I move L105 to SB 106. Tell us about L105, Senator Marchman. And I will do just that. So thank you. Um, one of the pieces of heartache I have as a homeowner is the settling that goes on in my home. And additional issues can be caused, but if I can fix the settling before additional things come up, then I'm going to be in a better situation. Um, I reached out to a real estate agent on this to find out what some of the issues are that are, you know, big problems when it comes to construction defects that don't show a full failure, but just if it's a little broken, it's not going to quite work. He's talked about the foundation settling, but also talked a lot about decks and balconies, which can create a safety issue. Um, so this would make me um, become um, favorable of, of this bill uh, because it, it acknowledges that little problems very quickly become very, very big problems. And the bill as drafted would not allow that work to be done unless actual damage had occurred. So I urge an I vote on L105. Senator Zenzinger. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Uh, members, I would urge a no vote on this amendment. If you look at the preceding paragraph on pages 20, lines 21 through 22, it says that if it causes one or more of the following, so it's not the sole condition um, that needs to be met, um, any of these things, um, one or more. Uh, furthermore, following that language on lines 36 through 39, this section does not prohibit limit or impair claims, including express contract claims, which would go to the deck example that was just brought up. So I would ask for a no vote. The motion is the adoption. Uh, Senator Hawkins Lewis. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I would like to speak in favor of this amendment. Um, thank you very much. Um, I have new homeowners to share with you. Um, it turns out that uh, Erie had a town hall about this. And the reason why 105 is important is let me share a scenario with you. This was from the Cass family, okay, in Erie. The soil, when they were landscaping the home, the soil wasn't properly prepared. And so when the f foundation was laid, um, it wasn't right. So what this amendment does is it would make it so that the homeowners wouldn't have to keep coming back and back and back because guess what happened next? The house actually started to twist and then the house started to stretch. Can you imagine trying to live in this house where the house is twisting and stretching? I mean, colleagues, this is a nightmare. I don't know if y'all have seen the movie The Money Pit, but this makes that movie with Tom Hanks look like a fantasy. This is the kind of situation that is going on with these homeowners. You have one symptom that develops, they'd have to bring a claim for that. And then when the walls don't close, they have to bring a claim for that. And then when the foundation and the, the landscaping start to make the garage lift, you have to bring a claim for that. That's why we need this amendment. We do not need to make homeowners be bringing in claim after claim after claim. That's what this amendment does. I'm asking for an I vote on L105. Senator Zenziger. Uh, thank you. Uh, members, we've actually already debated this because this line um, that they're trying to insert was in Amendment L-103, which we said no to. The same line is in Amendment L-104, which we've said no to. And I will repeat um, a no for Amendment L-105. Again, because it's not the sole factor, it's one or more and you were already covered by lines 36 through 39. So I would ask for a no vote. The motion, Senator Gonzalez. How 
help me understand, Senator, Madam Senator from Arvada. Um, <clears throat> The, the language that is contemplated under L105 is E, which corresponds back to 28 through 30 of page 3 on L99. 105 replaces that language with Yes, language that we have already discussed in the substitute to the strike below, 102. But help me understand where the good senator from Arvada spoke, and it was something new that I hadn't previously heard, so I want to make sure that I understand it. If you're saying that there are multiple, that there's one or more, can you just repeat that? Because I, I genuinely didn't hear it. But the, um, but the concern around 36 through 30, that doesn't, anyway, I, I'll let the senator from Arvada speak. Senator Zenzer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good questions. Um, I'm referring to the example that was brought up from the good senator from Longmont uh, concerning decks. And um, in the example of decks, they were talking about how maybe perhaps it was trex versus wood or vice versa. That is already covered in those lines where we're talking about the express contract claims. And the reason for that is, is because this section does not prohibit or limit those types of claims. So that is what I meant by that comment. Senator, uh, Senator uh, Coleman. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. And just to be clear, thank you very much to my co-prime, to the good senator from Denver. Um, her question in particular was regarding 105, which is E, lines three through five on the amendment for us in L99. Um, that is E, lines 28 through 30, an actual failure or lack of capacity of a building. The recommended language uh, in this amendment is not actual failure, it's unreasonable reduction. So I think there were two conversations happening in, in one, but in, in terms of this particular amendment, uh, we've seen this amendment before, we're asking for the actual failure language as a result, a, a, as opposed to unreasonable reduction as prior debated um, today. Senator Gonzalez. Now I understand. Thank you. Sometimes I'm a little slow. But there is no definition in this bill of an express contract claim. So I guess we'll talk about that later. But why the language of 105 is important. So if you live in a district that is subject to fire, which is, I don't know, feels like more and more districts across this street, across, across this state every day that's why the wood deck versus Gore-Tex deck matters. Because in this example, and we heard a, an absurd amount of information about this during the underlying committee hearing, was that E, in L99 says, um, well, you have to have an actual failure. You have to have a lack of capacity for the wood deck to perform its intended function. How is a wood deck that is meant to be fireproof 
or how is a deck that is meant to be fireproof when it's actually um, being built with wood instead of treks, how is that going to be able to perform its intended function? I don't think that that would be reasonable. Hence, the language that you see reflected in 105 being important. <clears throat> so, that's why this matters. If you agreed that your home should be built with fire-resistant materials, come to find out it's not, under L99, you'd have to wait for there to be an actual failure. Once the fire starts, I guess then you could file the claim. But unless and until that happens, sounds like you're out of luck. It's why L105 matters and is important. I ask for an I vote on L105. Minority Leader Lundin. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Let me cut to the chase. This whole conversation is about insurance costs. It's about driving insurance costs down so that we can actually build affordable housing. What amendment after amendment after amendment has said, you know what, that actual, that real, that empirical information, we don't want that. We only want to make it confusing, and this amendment will make it confusing, uncertain. It will make sure risk remains on the table. You know what happens when risk remains on the table? Insurance companies underwrite for it. Things get expensive. All of these amendments are anti-affordable housing. No to 106. Senator Marchman. Thank you. Um, we're on the amendment, L105, correct? Great. <laughs> okay, good, because the bill was 106, so I got a little confused there. Um, okay, that all makes sense. So when we did the strike below amendment, we put in place that the failure causes one or more of the following. So you can bring a claim if you have bodily injury or wrongful death. That's, that's great. Uh, verifiable danger to the occupants of the property or an actual failure. So like, what happens if your HVAC works, but it only works at about 40% capacity until it's at 0% under the strike below amendment, um, you cannot file a claim. So I, uh, I, I again, I, I don't think it's wise for this body to make choices on behalf of Colorado State homeowners that they must experience a failure before they can bring a claim. I urge an I vote on L-105. Senator Lundeen. Mr. Chair, public service announcement. I'm correcting what Senator Lundeen said previously. It's yes to 106, no to Amendment 105. The more you know. Senator Gonzalez. You know, the original introduced bill, Senate Bill 106, that sub D, page 9, line 24, of the introduced version included imminent and unreasonable language. What L99 replaces said language with is actual. That's the timing. When has it actually happened? Well, I guess in the deck example, when your house is on fire. And unreasonable, it's really interesting because that was in the in, in, introduced version. Unreasonable risk. But now, 
with L105, if we're asking for unreasonable reduction, that's somehow going to continue to drive up insurance costs? That's a curious argument from the minority leader. Because the introduced version, which included that threshold and legal standard, the sponsors told us during the committee hearing that that language would uh, lead to higher, I'm sorry, lead to lower insurance costs. Now I want to get back to how L105 interacts with page 3, lines 37 through 40, which is the exceptions to 1320.104. This section does not prohibit, limit, or impair claims, including express contract claims, that are not based upon violations of an applicable building code, manufacturer's instructions, or industry standard. Now, if the original claim and the original building code requires compliance, if the plans required that the the deck be built with treks, for example, as opposed to just a regular, regular wood deck. And the code requires compliance with those plans. And then the builder goes and builds a perfectly fine deck with wood instead of treks in a fire-prone area. A homeowner would be barred from bringing a claim under lines 37 through 40 of L99 to 106. It's for that reason the language in 105, in Amendment 105, is important. I ask for an I vote on L105 to Senate Bill 106. Senator Coleman. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair, and I appreciate the debate and the conversation. I'm asking for a no vote on 105. Seeing no further discussion, the question before us is the adoption of L105. All those in favor, say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. No. The noes have it. L105 is lost. Is there any further? Senator Marchman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, so now we're back to the strike below bill. I really do like this bill because I'm hopeful it's going to cause um, home ownership is a really, really important part of the picture that we have for, for housing options. So I, I really want to get there. Um, I just continue to struggle in a couple of areas um, with the bill. So I've got... Another amendment. There is an amendment coming to now present at the desk. Will the clerk please read L108? L108, amendment is under your Senator floor, Marchman. Marchman. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair. I move L108. To the amendment. Thanks so much. So. Beyond the issue that we spoke about in the last few amendments related to the fact that we want things to break before homeowners are allowed to call a claim, this bill, this amendment, um, it could be read that it would require every homeowner to file their own notice of claim. 
So that is not very efficient, that's pretty expensive, and that's not really gonna help our court system much. We want to ensure that HOAs are able to bring a single claim. We want to ensure that the processes, thresholds, and requirements set forth in statute about the homeowners, about the steps the homeowners must go through to take legal action are followed. But unfortunately, builders and developers often write provisions into contracts, homeowner association declarations, and purchase agreements that include prohibitions on consulting experts, requirements that builders may do any repair they wish, and that additional mediation processes occur, and that higher vote thresholds than those required in law be met. I have a lot of um, young families in my Senate district, and they certainly are, are looking to, to get into home ownership. And one of the things I always warn them about our metro districts. The other thing I warn them about are homeowners associations. I know. So the other one is homeowners associations. Um, I'm going to read. Uh, I'm going to read a couple of of, of of examples of what I have found in some HOA agreements that um, I propose we uh, don't make things harder for our homeowners. So this one says that um, notwithstanding any contrary provision contained in this uh, declaration, the association shall not have the authority and may not institute, defend, or intervene in litigation or administrative proceeding in its own name on behalf of two or more owners against any builder. Friends, that's sneaky. That's super sneaky. There's no reason that we should make our homeowners have to do claim after claim after claim. People can't afford that. I certainly wouldn't be able to afford that. I also bought an HOA, but we're not dealing with this issue right now. Um, another one that I read about is L108. Um, it talks about this little piece about L108. talks about a builder's offer to repair. So it says, once you find this construction defect, again, these are obstacles that are put in the way of homeowners from getting the work done to fix their home. What this one does is it says, if the builder offers to repair it, then the association may not impair, impede, or prohibit the builder from making repairs. So on behalf of a homeowner, HOAs are saying, you know, we're going to give this, this builder, we're going to give her an opportunity to fix the problems when she built this home. Um, and that's something that a homeowner should have the right to do. Um, and so what we're asking for in this amendment are two things. The efficiency of being able to bring at least one or more, at least two, um, claims on behalf of the association. And the second part says that you can't put anything that a homeowner signs that will make it more onerous than state law. What's the point of having state law if you're allowed to go put things in there that go above it? And in the current strike below that we're looking at right now, that is the case. So I urge your support of L108. Senator Coleman. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair, and thank you very much for this amendment. I'm asking for a no vote on 108, simply because we believe that the bill makes it clear that an HOA bringing claims on behalf of its individual members is subject to the same defenses those members would be subject to if they brought the claims without affecting how HOAs bring claims concerning common elements. If you look at um, page four of L99, this is additional language beyond line five, to be added after line five. We have stakeholded and had conversations. Both sides agreed that we would leave the pre-amended version up to line five the same. Uh, this is additional language that we did have an opportunity to review. I'm glad the amendment was brought for us to discuss it, but we're asking for a no vote on 108. Senator Jaquez Lewis. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Erie is back and Longmont is back. Let me tell you the saga of the Cass family and their neighbors. I am going to be kind and not bring up the builder involved, but you can look this up. 
the story is, uh, is definitely out in the press. So the division president of the builder said, yeah, we're gonna honor uh, the warranty claims that had been uh, put in about sinking, structure, garages that were coming loose, the landscaping issues that were causing the structural problems, the foundation problems. So they met. They met in a, in a group with the residents. Multiple residents attended. They stated that their warranty ticket claims had been closed, right? So the division head said, no, no, no. These, you should bring these. Well, guess what? If we don't pass 108, they're gonna have to bring every single claim piece by piece by piece, even if the company says, yeah, bring the warranty claims. I mean, I commend this builder for saying, bring them, we'll take a look. The problem is we're getting ready to pass a bill that is going to make these homeowners have to do claim by claim by claim. And, and he said he was sorry. He said, no amount of I'm sorry will fix these issues. He asked, he gave out his email, he gave out his phone number, and he said, I'll talk with you. The problem is if we pass this bill, they're gonna have to do each claim, one by one by one. Even though the builder is saying they wanna help them. That's why we have to pass L0108. Senator Marchman. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So again, I urge an I vote on L108. Um, I just wanted to talk a little bit more about the importance of being able to bring two or more claims at the same time. Guess what? When you have a multiple unit building, the same builder actually made all of the units. And so it's often that, um, you know, the, the issues they're running into are the same issues. Um, so this will, um, current, in current practice, community associations and HOAs are allowed to bring one claim on multiple owners' behalf. Um, this amendment is intended to make it clear that nothing in this bill is intended to prohibit an association from being, bringing claims on multiple owners' behalf in one action. When there are commonalities between claims, such as when multiple owners live in the same community, same neighborhood, same builder, same defects, same claims, these prohibitions that force each owner to pursue their own claims in separate actions significantly increases both the number and cost of construction defect claims. So it bogs up our judicial system. In the meantime, homeowners are sitting there waiting for more damage to hopefully not happen. This uh, bill seeks to do the opposite. Uh, they want to decrease the number and cost of construction defect actions. So this amendment is needed to clarify. Thank you. Senator Zenzinger. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, members, this section of the bill uh, has to do with HOAs when they are acting in their representative capacity. So um, individual homeowners can already go and make a claim and go to court. Um, HOAs can also make a claim and go to court. What we're saying in this section is that if an HOA chooses to make a claim and go to court and they're acting in a representative capacity, so they're representing their members, uh, then what we're saying in this section is that um, they, when they go to court and they're acting in a representative capacity, that they are subject to the same defenses that those members would be subject to if they had brought the claims individually. So it has to do with 
if an HOA makes a decision to represent the HOA in court, then they have to represent the members. They can't just represent the HOA, take the settlement, and then not make the homeowners whole. So um, in this section seven, um, I'll remind you that what we did is we, we removed the fiduciary component that was in seven section, and we limited the language to just the defenses. Uh, that's what this is. And so um, in speaking to an HOA that is defending its HOA, it has a duty to defend its members, and they have the ability to use the same defenses as if you were individually going to court to represent yourself. Um, when we were speaking with the opponents, they did not have any issues with that particular section. Um, adding additional language, however, um, it, it's, it's not relevant to the section simply because uh, this section isn't saying that they would have to um, uh, go to court individually. This is only pertains to HOAs when they are acting in a representative capacity. So the HOA has already decided that they're going to move forward uh, with a claim. And the HOA is going to court. And what we're saying is, is that they have to represent all of the HOA um, and, and that they have to direct their defenses have to be adequate to make sure that everybody is being taken care of. They can't just say, we got this, go to court, and then not actually address the person's issue when they are acting as a representative of the HOA. So um, we would ask for a no vote. Thank you. Senator Marchman. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you to the bill sponsor from Arvada for that um, explanation. So if that is in fact the case, um, then it should not be problematic that we're just clarifying that each homeowner does not have to bring its own claim. Um, as we speak to the people who are um, in my district who are struggling with this bill, it is an issue for them. So it may not have come out in your conversation with opponents, but it is something that has been brought to my attention from people in my district. So I would urge, I'm gonna read a little bit more. Oh, yep, so I just wanted to read a little bit more about what L108 will do. So what it says is it says the subject section 3C does not prohibit an association from asserting claims on behalf of two or more unit owners through a single action. And so what I just heard the bill sponsor say is you can do that under our bill. And so I'm saying, if so, then let's add this. I urge an I vote on 108. Senator Coleman. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Uh, again, asking for a no vote on 108 since uh, all of us are saying the same thing. The language is currently in the strike below. Should be fine. Ask for a no vote. Senator Hawkes Lewis. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I've done a little more reading about these situations in Erie where folks are having to bring try to bring claim by claim by claim, which is what this amendment is about. We want to make it reasonable for homeowners to be able to get their repairs fixed. This is really interesting to me. Um, the trustees in the town of Erie, which I represent, one of the trustees had a similar issue. But guess what? It was a different developer. That neighborhood, different developer, different community, could not get that developer to coalesce the claims and try to fix it. So they actually had to go to court. They had to hire uh, an attorney and actually take legal action against the developer. Now again, if we don't pass this amendment, think of all the litigation that is going to be going on. And the folks that can't afford it, they're just stuck. They're stuck with this picture that I see that happened in a Morgan Hill home 
where the entire driveway just dropped. I mean, you can see these pictures. This is real life that we're dealing with. Another trustee said, yep, they had so many complaints that that's why they called the meeting to deal with this. A third trustee said, well, it's good the developer is, is working with the residents and we're sorry that they're gonna have to take all these claims to court. Well, this, this is gonna happen in neighborhood after neighborhood after neighborhood if we don't fix this bill today. We have got to make this bill something that will protect homeowners. And the purpose of it, the purpose of this policy is to try to get more affordable housing. But if, and what this amendment is doing to try to fix the policy is to make sure that if an issue happens, you don't have to go claim by claim by claim. Not every town will take the action that Erie has. I mean, basically the town has been directed, they're looking at getting the staff to consider opening an investigation on the developer. And especially if more problems keep coming forward. And that's great, but if we have language the way it is now without accepting Amendment 108, every single claim will have to be documented and investigated. That's not what we want. That is not what we want. Let's go ahead and adopt L108 and solve this problem about homeowners having to put in claim after claim after claim. I on 108. Senator Marchman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So I spoke about the first part of what 108 does in terms of, um, you know, it, you can bring two or more units, the homeowner associate can bring two or more units in one action. We heard from the sponsors, that's already covered. Okay, but they still don't want it to be put in the bill. Hmm, that's weird. Um, but let me talk about the second part. The second part, starting with number five, it's in line eight, says any provision in law, a contract, or an association's governing documents is void as against public policy if the provision, two things, applies to a common interest community and contains construction defect pre-claim procedures more onerous than those contained in this section. And so I just wanna kinda, kinda talk a little bit about that. Um, so if an HOA were to bring a claim on behalf of multiple unit owners, but their purchase contract, which they signed, says you're not allowed to do that, then they're gonna actually throw out the HOA's claims on behalf of the owners. Um, so I, 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 I did hear the good uh, bill sponsor from Arvada saying, um, you know, that this is not going to be a problem, but I just want you to understand that if, if you sign your rights away, as you could under L099, then when you take this to court and your HOA takes it to court, you don't get your claim taken care of because they're going to tell you, oh, you're not allowed to do that. So what the second part of 108 does is it says, look what, look, you don't get to have owners wave their rights away for construction defects. It's their biggest investment. Most people's biggest investment is their home. So that's what that second part is. If this is state law, and builders and developers are creating HOAs that have requirements that are at this level, that is not fair and that is not the intent of this body. And that is what L108 would do. I urge an I vote. Seeing no further discussion, the question before us is the adoption of L10. Division has been called.
All those in favor of L108, please stand. All those opposed? The chair is, the chair is not in doubt. L108 is lost. Seeing no further amendments. Oh, Senator Cutter. We're going to take a quick senatorial five, folks. Meet. Will the clerk please read L106. L106. Senator Cutter. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd like to move uh, L106 to Senate Bill 106. So move to the amendment. So it will apply this. So Senate Bill 106 will apply the standards for negligence claims to all claims. Um, we're concerned about this. Homeowners should be able to hold builders accountable for contract provisions that were not fulfilled. So, and if promises, if certain promises were made under a warranty, homeowners should be able to hold builders accountable for failure to meet those. Homeowners' rights will be severely limited in favor of builders under this provision. The contract warranty issue involves preserving the bare minimum protections for homeowners. Preserving contract warranty claims will immunize builders from liability for their own fraud and provide a significant opportunity for builders to decrease profits by deceiving homeowners as long as the deceptive or fraudulent practices practice does not cause one of the listed harms. 
Homeowners shouldn't have to pay to fix builders' deviations from requirements, especially when homeowners will be required to pay to fix many of these defects or reduce their home sale price in order to sell their homes to another buyer. It's essential that contract claims be exempted from this broader claim prohibition. Homeowners will no longer be able to bring claims based on the following, even when a homeowner paid for the improperly installed or promised component, such as improperly installed handrails or stairs. 10 electrical outlets are installed instead of the 40 required by code. A roof is constructed with wood shingles instead of asphalt shingles. Stair treads are six inches higher than, <laughs> than what the code requires. A deck is constructed with regular wood instead of treks, which is more expensive and lasts longer. A fence is constructed with chicken wire instead of wood. Low quality or used appliances are substituted for new appliances. Low quality carpet is substituted for mid-grade carpet and carpet padding was omitted. Um, a, a bathroom is constructed with one sink instead of two sinks. Closet doors are omitted. You understand, you get the drift. Lots of things um, that could go wrong and we, I ask for your support of this amendment. Senator Lundeen. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Um, I rise in opposition to uh, Amendment 106 to Senate Bill 106. So this time when I say no on 106, I actually mean it. Um, th this amendment simply takes language including express contract claims. It allows that to remain, but then it adds this idea of or claims. Excessively vague. When I was talking with these people about the condominium that I hope to buy, they said to me, Mr. Lundeen, if you buy this condominium, you will be taller, better looking, and smarter. That is a claim that they made, and I am collecting on that. I am not taller, better looking, and smarter. And that is a claim that has not been fulfilled. This so, Lundin, condominium is therefore subject to construction defects Do, do not disparage members of this chamber, including yourself, <laughs> Senator Lundin. Speak to the amendment. To the amendment, so sir. So to the point, this is written in such a way as to be absurdly overbroad Therefore, a threat to that which I keep coming back to and saying we must address. We've got to drive insurance costs down. This will have the exact opposite effect by creating uncertainty. And quite frankly, I'm not any better looking, I'm not any taller, and I'm not any smarter. Therefore, I urge you vote against Amendment 106. What a great bridge to Senator Coleman, who had his hand up. Oh, Senator Colker? Nice hop. Senator Colker. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I just have a question for the sponsors on this particular portion of the bill that this amended, amendment is addressing, um, where it says express claims. I just want to make sure, because I heard the uh, minority leader talk about being overly broad, is the current, amend, or current verbiage including everything? Because it says express claims. Is it limiting express claims? or is it express claims plus other things? Senator Coleman. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. So when we say, once again, section three of the bill does not prohibit limit or impair claims including express contract claims that are not based upon violations of applicable building code, manufacturer's instructions, or industry standard. To be clear, we are saying that it does not prohibit all claims, including express contract claims. And we ask for a no vote on 106. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, the question before us, Senator Cutter. Senator, is there any further discussion on amendment L106? Going once. Going twice, Sorry. seeing no further discussion on Senate Bill 106, the question before us is the adoption of... Sorry, Senate, sorry, amendment. You know, the numbers, I had made the same mistake that Senator Lundeen did. Apologies to the amendment 106. Amendment 106 to Senate Bill 106. The question before us is the adoption of amendment 106 to Senate Bill 106. All those in favor of the amendment, say aye. All those opposed. The noes have it. An amendment, L106, is lost. Apologies, colleagues.
106 to 106. Senator Gonzalez. There is an amendment at the desk. Will the clerk please read L110. L110, amend the Senator, Senator Ford, Gonzalez. Amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move 110 to Senate Bill 106. So move to the amendment. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, this may be a, I hope that, that the sponsors will see this amendment as a friendly amendment because as you see, 1320.804, the bold section says restriction on construction defect negligence claims. And then sub one strikes no negligence claim seeking damages for a construction defect may be asserted in and replaces that language with a claimant is barred from bringing or maintaining a claim seeking damages but does not qualify that with the phrase, neg with the phrase negligence claims. So L110 seeks to reinsert the descriptive negligence claims on page three, line 16, which I hope and understand to have been the original intent of the sponsors, I'd ask for an I vote on L110. Is there any further discussion? Senator Zinziger. Uh, thank you very much for uh, bringing the suggestion. Uh, this section of law 13-20-804 concerns restriction on construction defect negligence claims. So it already uh, refers to that. So I believe that the addition uh, would be duplicative and not necessary. So thank you. Senator Gonzalez. And yet, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. And yet, if there is not that qualifier in sub one of uh, 18, I'm sorry, 1320804. Contracts are then included. Warranty claims are then included. This is a broad expansion of what I understood to be the intent of the sponsors in, uh, in uh, the strike below to L99. And so again, I, I'd like to better understand why uh, the bill, I'm sorry, why the, um, Amendment L99 does not also reflect the word negligence claims because that's what we're, I understand for us to be talking about. Not warranty claims, not, again, if we're trying to Uh, clarify what we're the types of claimings that the types of claims that we are seeking to um, bar and the worthwhile claims I just I don't understand why we wouldn't actually ensure that sub one reads a claimant is barred from bringing or maintaining a negligence claim. I ask for an I vote. Senator Gardner. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, this, 
This amendment seeks to add the word negligence and so limit the bar for claims to only negligence claims. Um, the reason that the strike below and, and the uh, language for the now what is the bill or, is written this way is because you find that lawyers will change the name on something and call it a different kind of claim. They'll call it a they'll call it contractual when in fact it is more negligence or um, in other cases they'll try to frame it as a negligence claim when it's contractual. This this uh, restriction in, in L099, which is now the bill, says a claimant is barred from bringing or maintaining a claim seeking damages for a construction defect as an action uh, if the claim arises from failure to construct. I will tell you, though, where the protection for the consumer is here, because the language at... at uh, Page three, lines uh, 19, 20, and, and following says, except that the claim, not just a negligence claim, but any claim, the claim may be asserted if the failure causes one or more of the following. And so you don't have to have negligence if it causes actual damage to real or personal property, that's all in, always already in the bill actual loss of the use of real or personal property. That's already in the bill. Bodily injury or wrongful death. Those all look like negligent tort kind of claims to me. Um, and then you have the verifiable danger to the occupants of the residential uh, real property. So it, it seems to me that the insertion of this word negligence here um, it begins to work mischief uh, in terms of lawyers trying to second guess or play games with how they uh, how they frame a claim, uh, and it just it, it may in so many cases be meaningless, and in so many other cases it may be that it causes needless litigation when we should just say it's all claims, however they're framed, whether framed in tort and contract, um, and you can, if, if the failure causes one or more of the following and these things are not like negligence and whatever, it's this, these kinds of damages. And it's better by far in this kind of circumstance to say claims, whether they're tort, contract, uh, whatever, that causes certain kinds of damages. And so then lawyers can't play games and say, oh, no, my, my claim is in contract. Oh, oh, no, my claim is not negligence. And by the way, it would seem to be that the more appropriate term would not be negligence but tort, uh, which would cover anything that wasn't contractual. So um, in the interest of clarity in, in the bill, I urge a no vote on L110. Senator Hawkins Lewis. Thank you, Mr. Chair. You know, we've spent a lot of time on focusing on Erie Longmont because, you know, that's what I know, but um, we've had a chance to take a look at some other areas. Now, why is 110? Why is this amendment so important? Because as you heard the good senator from Denver say, this reinserts the negligence claims. That's the ability for the homeowners to look at the negligence of the builder. So this is, this is an initial complaint. This is off of Better Business Bureau complaints. We've got several of them. These are all Adams County. Every one of these, Adams County. The first one is they had a complaint with the contractor 
four warranty issues, a negligent complaint on, they fixed the floor, but they didn't fix the pantry and the stair railings were coming down. This is Adams County. Next one, different complaint, same builder, Adams County, contacting them about faulty electrical. That's a warranty claim. But if we don't pass 110, how are they gonna, how are they gonna reinsert negligence claims? How's that gonna happen? Another claim, these are all Better Business Bureau. They haven't even gotten a response from the contractor that was working on their home. And this is on interior doors that were damaged and they couldn't replace them. And now multiple LVP flooring planks are rising up. I don't know what that is, but it doesn't sound good. I wouldn't want to walk across my floors if the planks are rising up. That sounds definitely like a negligence claim. Again, Adams County. Another warranty claim, it's about, this is 17, 17 houses. This one's Better Business Bureau. I'm not gonna say the name of the builder, I'm not gonna say the neighborhood, I'm telling you it's Adams County. 17 houses that have warranty tickets for LVP. Again, this amendment reinserts the negligence claims, reinserts the ability for the homeowners to have these negligence claims. This is damaged flooring, y'all. 17 homes on this one complaint. All right, another one. Again, Adams County. They, they have here emailed several times asking for compensation for landscaping. The contractor's now saying no previous record of warranty requests. Well, imagine if we don't pass Amendment 110. They're not going to be able to have their negligence claims looked at. In fact, this one says the compensation, when they finally got an answer, the compensation it was offered was, and it's got expletives listed on it. Adams County, got another one here. Same builder. Some of the, the contractors said, yep, we'll send somebody out. This is tiling falling apart, crumbling. Tiling in the bathroom. Uh, nope, they're not coming out. They're going to have a subcontra subcontractor come out. Again, if we don't pass this amendment, how are these folks going to do the negligence claims? I could keep going. I have one left. This one, woo, this is a list here. The home builder responded to the homeowner in Adams County, we're losing money on this home. We are sorry, but we're losing money. We're sorry that the floors were scratched. We're sorry that the windows were not put in properly. We're sorry that the garage doors are not closing. We're sorry that the a AC is not working. Y'all, seriously, why are we skewing this policy away from what the homeowners need? Please accept this amendment 110 that will make sure that negligence claims can be addressed. Vote aye on 110. Senator Gonzalez. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. What we're trying to address, and I went out and I spoke uh, to the proponents uh, lobby um, because again, what I'm trying to underscore and clarify is that the statute that we're amending is qualified with the word negligence claims. 
L99, page three, line 13, 1320-804, restriction on construction defect negligence claims. However, the actual language, sub one, a claimant is barred from bringing or maintaining a claim. Imagine a world, or imagine a scenario where, well, let me back up by stating that Sidara applies to a host of different types of actions from the statute. Action means a civil action or an arbitration proceeding for damages, indemnity, or contribution brought against a construction professional to assert a claim, counterclaim, cross-claim, or a third-party claim for damages or loss to, or the loss of use of, real or personal property, or, prefer, or personal injury caused by a defect in the design or construction of an improvement to real property. Sadara allows currently all claims as long as they're within the definition of action. 110 doesn't change that, but what it does do is clarify that the owners of a new home have recourse when said contract claims are negligent in how they are completed. Meaning, your designs, your plans, what was promised was, I don't know, two sinks. You end up with one. Countertops. You're told to, or the construct, the, the, Builder is asked to bring forward, um, I don't know, marble countertops and instead puts in laminate. Do we really want homeowners to have to demonstrate that the clause of the contract that wasn't followed has to be a verifiable danger? Or that it'll cause bod bodily injury before they can bring forward one of these claims? Look, at the end of the day, if a builder can't be held accountable for what they put in the contracts, we'll have a whole other set of problems here, colleagues. That's why I'm asking for adoption of L110. Thank you, Mr. Chair. The motion is the adoption of L110. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed, no. No. The no's have it, and L110 is lost. Senator Sullivan. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, we are to the bill, correct? Senator Sullivan, that's correct. Okay, thank you, sir. Boy, um, I'm uh, not sure if I'm excited to be in the, on the middle of this conversation, but I'm um, hearing a lot of people talk about um, court cases and going to court and talking to lawyers. Um, I mean, I can tell you that homeowners don't want to go to court. Um, I spent three and a half months uh, in, a, in a courtroom. It's horrible. I, I, I hope I never, ever have to go to court again. Because I know probably with my luck, I'll be in there with Atticus Finch and Boo Radley as my investigator, and I'm going to be sitting there up against um, you know, uh, Law and & Order, and their entire staff and team will be coming at me and I'm trying to protect my home, which, again, I'm going to debate with you on 
Um, the most valuable asset that I have, I, I think both my kids are priceless, and uh, it doesn't matter how much I have to spend uh, on the two of them, but, um, you know, uh, certainly the, uh, the house um, has gone uh, right up there as well. But uh, as a part of this uh, conversation, um, I have an amendment here that I would like to add. There is an amendment at the desk. Will the clerk please read wow. Amendment 111? Oh, 111 Amendment. Senator Sullivan. Sullivan. Floor amendment. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, with um, 111, um, this bill's meant uh, to promote repairs getting done uh, for homeowners, and uh, we need to make sure that these repairs are made right and and are are done well. Um, you know, that's uh, you know really what what people are looking for. I mean, I don't know if everybody knows this, but but. We don't even require construction professionals to carry insurance in Colorado. I mean, you're sitting there having, you know, people, you know, build your home or, or, or work on petitions or parts of your home. And, um, you know, they don't even have um, insurance to make sure should, should something happen or fall or someone trip um, that uh, they're going to be covered and then in, in effect that, that you're covered. So uh, with that, I ask um, that we approve, um, did I move it? Uh, I move um, Amendment L111 to Senate Bill 106 and ask for an aye vote. So moved, thank you, Senator Sullivan. I forget that part all the time. Any further discussion? Seeing none, Senator Coleman. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair, and thank you to the good senator for bringing this amendment. This amendment um, deals with what would have been a section of our original pre-amended uh, bill, uh, not L99. This obviously is going towards L99, but the initial portion of our bill that is dealt with was notice of claims. And in conversation with uh, opposition, we actually agreed to remove this section of uh, the bill um, because what we wanted to primarily focus on was informed consent and technical code issues as claim. And so that being said, we're asking for a no vote on 111. Is there any further discussion of L111? Seeing none, the question before us is the adoption of L111. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. No. The no's have it and L111 is lost. <laughs> Senator Sullivan. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. So, okay, we tried something a little little meatier there, and uh, that doesn't seem to work. So um, sitting back there watching and listening to everybody else uh, on how they kind of process through this, I'm gonna, gonna try a, a, a new amendment here. This is gonna be uh, Amendment uh, 1113. There is an amendment at the desk. Will the clerk please read Amendment L113. L113, amend the Senator Senator Sullivan. Amendment. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I move Amendment L113. So moved. Senate to the Bill amendment. 106. To the amendment. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Chair. Yeah, so this is, is just kind of, um, um, you know, takes it a step down. And um, we're looking on, on this part here is to uh, require evidence uh, from the insurers of the contractors that they, uh, they at least have um, workman's comp uh, for any remedial work uh, that is done by any of the contractors or uh, the developers. And uh, with that, I ask uh, for your aye vote. Senator Coleman. Thank you again, Mr. Chair, and thank you for this amendment. And again, this deals members of notice of claim process and discussion with opposition as well as ourselves. Uh, we determined that we wanted the bill to primarily, again, uh, focus on informed consent and technical code issues as claims. We believe that that supports homeowners' rights as well as um, helps us build more affordable housing. We're asking for a no vote on this notice of claims. It's been strict, stricken uh, from L99. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, the question before us. Division, Division has been requested.
As previously stated, a division has been requested on L113. All those in the chamber not entitled to vote, please take a seat. All those who support L113, please stand. All those opposed? The chair is not in doubt. That amendment is lost. Senator Sullivan. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, so that's how that goes. Um, so we'll take it a little uh, step down. And I have a, uh, another amendment. There's an amendment at the desk. Will the clerk please read L114? L114, amend the Zenzinger floor amendment. Senator Sullivan. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I move uh, amendment L114 to Senate Bill 106. So moved to the amendment, please. Okay, uh, so since we didn't want to uh, make some big changes and we didn't want to work on uh, workman's compensation for those, um, maybe we might be uh, interested in, in at least requiring uh, that the remedial work uh, comply with applicable building codes. Um, that's what's going to be in um, Amendment 114, and I ask for an aye vote. Senator Coleman. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Again, notice of claims process was taken out of the original bill and is no longer in L99 right to remedy. Once again, this policy as it stands is focused on informed consent and technical code issues as claims. We're asking for a no vote on 114. Is there any further discussion of Amendment L114? Seeing none, the question before us is the adoption of L114. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no? The no's have it, and L114 is lost. Senator Sullivan. Uh, did you see me moving up here? <laughs> Much uh, thank you, Mr. Senator. Chair. Um, okay, so now what we would like to do is um, move. Um, where are my new ones? There we are. There is an amendment at the desk. Will the clerk please read L-115. L-115, amend the Senator floor, Sullivan. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I move uh, Amendment L-115 to Senate Bill 106. To the amendment. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so this is uh, um, some additions uh, to the legislative uh, declaration um, there. Um, what we want to do, there's, um, we want to talk about, uh, you know, condo de development and insurance costs, we need to remember that homes are people's uh, biggest investments, and when they have serious construction problems, their financial well-being can, can be at risk. So we want to make sure um, that all of those uh, types of items are, are addressed in this legislation, and for that reason, I ask uh, for your I vote on Amendment L0, uh, L115. Senator Coleman. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. And while I appreciate further clarification around what this bill does, um, I'm asking for a no vote on 115, in particular because we did a really great job, along with opposition, discussing things that we were asked uh, to make sure we provided. Uh, one of those things that was asked of us was, what's going on with insurance, and why is it that we keep hearing insurance uh, is having a hard time supporting builders to build more affordable housing? And we included a lot of that language in here. And so for that being said, I appreciate this amendment, but I'm asking for a no vote. Is there any further discussion? Senator Gonzalez. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Let me read from L115 that the sponsors have just asked for a no vote on. 
The construction of affordable housing will only create financial stability, economic mobility, and intergenerational wealth if the buyers of affordable housing are not unfairly burdened with the cost to repair construction defects caused by builder negligence and homeowners who are prevented per from pursuing legal remedies for construction defects may be prevented from refinancing or selling their homes and may be subjected to financial insecurity, bankruptcy, or foreclosure. This is an amendment to the ledge deck. This is just a statement of principle and value. And the sponsors of this amendment have asked for a no vote on this language. Even just to state and affirm that I don't know. Oh, line four of L115. Building codes are adopted to establish minimum requirements to safeguard the public safety, health, and general welfare, and to provide safety to firefighters and emergency responders during emergency operations. I don't see what's controversial about that. Are we so intent on saying no to every single amendment that even an acknowledgement that the goal in which I think we all share in this building and in this body and here on this floor today where we all want to increase the opportunities for homeownership and particularly homeownership for folks who live in multifamily affordable housing. I happen to be a person who lives in a multifamily affordable housing condo unit. I feel like a unicorn. I'd like for there to be more people, more Coloradans across this state who are able to benefit from home ownership. I'd like to no longer be a unicorn. I appreciate the good senator from Centennial in bringing forward this amendment. Because I think, and I would hope, that there is nothing in this language of this amendment that is controversial. Two, line 16 of L115, the General Assembly declares that this act, A, is intended to protect homeowner rights to seek redress for construction defects and to be able to pursue the most efficient and cost effective dispute resolution process to be made whole, and B, is not intended to be interpreted in a manner that would have the effect of lowering the quality of construction in the state of Colorado or encouraging builders to ignore building codes. Colleagues, is that controversial? The sponsors asked for a no vote on it. I asked for an I vote. Senator Zenzinger. Uh, thank you very much, um, Mr. Chair. Um, I would request a senatorial five. Um, this is the first that I am seeing this language. Um, I think that we have tried to accommodate uh, suggestions that have been brought to us prior to today in this moment. And um, I just would like some time to be able to read through it and uh, think through the implications. And so I request a senatorial five. Senatorial five granted.
And we're back. Senator Zenzinger. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, because we had not uh, seen this language uh, prior to now, and um, many of the amendments that have been offered uh, in the past were things that we had already said no to, I think we probably approached this with more suspicion than it merited. And so upon further review, um, we believe that this, um, uh, these changes to the ledge deck um, are uh, acceptable. Um, so uh, we would uh, not oppose the amendment. Senator Lundeen. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Um, it's probably irrelevant to the conversation if the bill sponsors are willing to take this and the, uh, the offer of the amendment persists, then it probably becomes part of the legislative declaration. As we all know, that's in, intended to lay out intent. Um, I have, just on a quick review of this, have three objections to the intent that this seeks to lay out. Um, on lines 12 and following, it, it says homeowners are prevented from pursuing legal remedies. Nobody's being pursued being uh, uh, prevented from pursuing le legal remedies, so object to that, for construction defects may be prevented, then it goes into the land of conjecture, may be prevented from refinancing, not quite sure how that would play into the circumstance, or selling their homes and may be subjected to financial insecurity, bankruptcy, or foreclosure, and they might miss next Christmas also. The reality is this language is excessive and goes beyond anything that this bill is intended to talk about. It goes on uh, down on line 18 and to through 20 and following. It says, uh, it, it is intended to protect homeowners' rights, the, the, the legislation, to seek redress for construction de defects and to be able to pursue the most cost-efficient and cost-effective dispute resolution process. The, the reality is the, the most effective, most efficient cost dispute resolution process is for an individual to engage in a conversation with the provider of the service or good to seek the solution that resolves the matter for the willing buyer and the willing seller. Yeah, this bill is about managing beyond that. This language has nothing to do with what's being sought to be done and therefore should be removed. And I could go on, there's a third objection, but I'll let it go at that. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Lundeen. Is there any further discussion? Senator Sullivan. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, just to um, talk about the, the prevention of, of refinancing, I don't know if any of you um, have been impacted by um, a, a hailstorm, um, but my home was impacted by a hailstorm uh, last May. Um, it isn't finished yet, okay? We're, we're 11 months later. So I don't have the ability to try to find myself a new uh, insurer. I'm not uh, having the uh, ability uh, to do any other home improvements or, or financing that involves my home because it's not at 100%. So that, I believe, it will, will, would answer that. If there is, if you're in litigation or in, in conversations about defects um, that are impacting your home, everything stops until that gets taken care of. So that's why I think that's a good line, and uh, I appreciate the, uh, the sponsors um, agreeing with us and asking for an I vote. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, the question before us is the adoption of L115. All those in favor say aye. Aye! Opposed, no. No! The ayes have it, and L115 is adopted. Yeah. Senator Jaquez Lewis. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, we've been talking about rights for uh, homeowners, and so we have some. I have an amendment that we'll talk about having to do with homeowner and property rights. There is an amendment so at the desk. I move. One second. Not yet. Don't Hold move on. it yet. There is an amendment at the desk. Will the clerk please read L? 109. Oh, 109. I'm in the Zendigo floor. <laughs> Senator <I'm> Huckes Lewis. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Chair. Now, now's the time. Let's move it. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I move L109 to so Senate moved Bill 106. To the amendment. So, we've heard a lot about how homeowners will not be protected. We've heard a lot about some of the things that can go wrong with this bill in protecting homeowners' rights. So let's just put it right in there. 
let's have a section in the bill that will outline home and property owner rights. These are pretty straightforward, but just want to make sure everybody's on the same page. The, the homeowner will have the right to determine who enters the property to repair it. That's pretty common sense, right? And when the construction professional may enter said property. So if you need something fixed, you get to say who comes into your home and uh, when they come into the home. Pretty basic. Uh, they have the right to refuse or accept insufficient or substandard repairs. That's pretty good, right? If your floor's coming up, if the garage doors are falling off, you can say, hey, you didn't fix it right. That's what this is about. Um, that they will be able to receive accurate and timely and honest information from the construction professional who is doing the repairs. That's really basic, right? They need to get honest information about how that construction professional is going to fix the repair. Also, and that we, we've touched on this a little bit, but let's put it into the, the rights of the bill. Let's put this section back into it. I, I don't think we actually ever had a rights section, but this is all about homeowners' rights and what they can do and what they can't do. So let's lay it out. We need for the person doing the construction, doing the repair, to carry adequate liability insurance. What if they go to fix the cracked uh, concrete driveway and something else happens? They cause damage. They need liability insurance. What if uh, the work that they do is not in compliance with the manufacturer's instructions? Colleagues, these are really basic rights. We would like for those repairs that are done by the construction company to make sure they're doing it to code, right? So that's what this says. Have work performed in compliance with relevant building codes. These are basic homeowner rights. How in the world would we be opposed to these basic rights? Let's just put it in the bill. Then everyone knows what can be covered and what can't be. Only got two more. This isn't a big bill of rights. This is a basic homeowner's bill of rights. Be informed about the work performed and the amount that will be charged. We all get an estimate on our repairs. We all try to get an estimate. If your car is getting repaired, you try to ask the mechanic, what is this going to cost? That's what's in this. Let's ask the person that's going to do the repair, what do they think that the homeowner is going to be charged? And last but not least, very important though, let's make sure that the property owner, the homeowner, if they suffer any losses or injuries or damages as a result of defective work, that they be made whole. The homeowner shouldn't lose money on a repair that should have been done right in the first time. Let's turn, this, let's turn this bill into, instead of a money pit, let's turn it into something good. Let's turn this into a bill that we can be proud of. And by accepting Amendment 109, we're doing the right thing. We're protecting folks' rights. We're protecting what homeowners need. This will make this bill a lot stronger. I'm asking for an I vote on Homeowners' Rights, Amendment 109. Senator Coleman. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair, and thank you very much for this amendment. L109 would uh, bring us back to where we are. This bill that we're currently debating uh, is about claims processes. The terms, uh, I believe, in 109 are undefined. I believe it would cause a little bit of ambiguity. Um, I would say that if we want to talk about these, it's a separate bill, and I can't wait to run that bill with a good senator from Longmont. I ask for a no vote. Senator Hawkins Lewis. Thank you, Mr. Chair. The good senator from Denver, Park Hill. 
Greenwood Village, sort of. Um, hey, hey, that's me. Yeah, Green Valley Ranch. There we go. Corrected. I stand corrected. Um, will you please enlighten me on the ambiguity, just to make sure, because I want to make sure I get these right. Senator Coleman. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair, and thank you to the good senator from Longmont. When I read through this, I recognize that we literally have a portion of most of the bills that we pass with definitions explaining what some of the language is. And while I believe that there's a lot of good content here, I believe that it can be taken out of context, even if it was not intended. And so for us, we're asking for a no vote. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, the question before us is the adoption of L109. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed no. No. The noes have it, and that amendment is lost. <laughs> Senator Gonzalez. There is an amendment at the desk. Will the clerk please read L128. L128, amend the Zunziger floor amendment. Senator Gonzalez. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. I move L128 to Senate Bill 106. To the amendment. Thank you. This amendment builds off of uh, and is a more narrow iteration of the amendment that the good senator from Loveland initially ran, oh, 20 amendments ago. Senate L108 to um, Senate Bill 106. And this um, is a um, one aspect of the amendment um, that proponents and opponents have come to agreement to. And I hope that the sponsors of 106 will see L128 as a friendly amendment. I ask for an I vote. Senator Zenzinger. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, members, um, we do accept this amendment. Um, reflecting back on that prior amendment, um, there were two sections to it. This section, um, we actually had spoken with the opponents about um, prior to this um, uh, debate today, and um, we acknowledged that um, this was something that uh, we could add. Um, we just figured uh, that we would um, add it uh, when the bill uh, moves over to the House, but we are comfortable adding it in this chamber if that is what the body sees fit. Thank you. Senator Coleman. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair, I have never been happier to accept an amendment as I am on L128. We ask for an I vote the happiest that Senator Coleman has ever been. Is there any further discussion on L-128? Talk about why it's so good. Seeing no further discussion, the question before us is the adoption of L-128. All those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed, no. no. Ayes have it, and 128 is adopted. <laughs> Senator Gonzalez. There is an amendment at the desk. Will the clerk please read L? 118. L118. Senator Amanda Gonzalez. Sinziger. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move L118 to Senate Bill 106. To the amendment. Thank you. Um, what this amendment seeks to do uh, is to ensure that the strike below L99 allows for the loss of product warranty. Um, claims. So you will recall earlier I brought an amendment that sought to clarify and narrow the types of claims to negligence claims. The proponents of and sponsors of, L1, of Senate Bill 106 um, declined to accept said amendment. So now what L118 seeks to do is to allow a negligence claim when a construction defect results in avoided product warranty. So, if it was installed incorrectly, thereby, you know, user error that they're thereafter voiding out the warranty, the homeowner should be protected and able to still pursue a negligence claim. This 
clarification will actually help ensure that repairs get fixed and are covered under uh, the intent of Senate Bill 106. I ask for an I vote. Is there any further discussion? Senator Zenzinger. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'd like to request a Senatorial 5 so that I can review the amendment. Senatorial 5 requested and granted. There, now we're back. Senator Zenzinger. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I can appreciate and want to thank the sponsor of the amendment, um, but I will have to ask for a no. Um, by adding that section uh, to this, um, we actually deal with those uh, warranties differently. Those are breach of contracts. We don't uh, deal with them as uh, defect issues, so I would have to ask for a no vote, but thank you. Senator Gonzalez. And yet, thank you, Mr. Chair, and yet, when we're talking about how the homeowner experiences said response from the sponsors, when you realize that there's a problem with, say, your roof shingles, that they were in, in, installed improperly. And you go to the builder and, said, and say, hey, I'm sorry, these roof shingles were installed improperly. And they say, I dispute that. And then you go to court and What I would like to do via 118 is to ensure that 
if the warranty is voided out because of the negligence of the builder or the worker who installed a product incorrectly, it wasn't the manufacturer's uh, claim. Uh, I'm sorry, it wasn't the manufacturer's um, uh, issue. It was the builder's issue. This, the intent of 118 is to clarify, not to further confuse. If there's another section of statute that the homeowner should instead go to, I'm sorry, can you help me um, understand what, um, where a homeowner who has a brand new roof that was improperly installed, thereby voiding out a warranty, help me point to where they should be directing their claims instead, if not, 18, I'm sorry, 1320-804 sub 1. What I'm hoping to do is to clarify and ensure that there's one F. If not there, where should those types of claims be directed to? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, Senator Gonzalez. Thank you, Madam, uh, Mr. Chair. The, if the question is, oh, that's, that's found, those claims are handled in a different way, those claims would be addressed differently, how would they be addressed? How is that? How is not clarifying that if a builder's negligence voided out a floor or a roof? Wouldn't we want to ensure protection for those workers? I'm sorry, for, the, for that homeowner? I got a call yesterday because back in August I went to Target and I bought a Black & Decker steamer which clearly is broken because look how wrinkly I am today. <laughs> <laughs> well, I got a call yesterday that the Black & Decker steamer that I bought for 16 bucks at Target was being recalled. That's the manufacturer taking responsibility and saying, hey, let me, let me make it right. There's a reason I'm so wrinkly, y'all. It's kind of embarrassing. But um, that's, the, that's the person who put out a bad product taking responsibility and saying, yo, you got, call this number. I called them, of course, it was a late night here at the Capitol, and so when I called them, their offices on the East Coast had already closed. So I gotta call them again today if we ever get off the floor. But, um, you know, had I called and then they said, oh, no, 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 you have to instead call somebody else, as opposed to the manufacturer, how is that not providing clarification for a consumer, in this case, the homeowner? What L-118 seeks to simply do is to ensure and clarify that if the warranty, had it been installed correctly, there wouldn't be a voiding of the warranty, but because it wasn't, the warranty is voided out, that's a negligence claim that should be able to be raised underneath L-118. Thank you, Mr. Chair.
Senator Zinzinger. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Well, you can already bring contract claims outside of Sadara, and warranty claims are contract claims. Uh, it would be more expensive to try and pull it in under Sadara uh, and make it a Sadara claim um, because it would be more expensive, first of all, and secondly, you already have a process to deal with those, and so I would ask for a no vote. Senator Gonzalez. But the contract claim is that with the manufacturer of the product whose warranty is voided out, or is that with the builder? Asking for clarification from the sponsor, Mr. Chair. Senator Zenzinger. Uh, because we do not deal with that in this bill, um, I cannot answer your question because we did not put much time into researching warranty claims. Senator Gonzalez. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. And thank you, uh, Senator, to the good, th gratitude and appreciation to the good Senator from Arvada um, for um, that response. The reason I ask is because the strike below at page, uh, uh, the strike below to 106, L99, page 3, lines 34, strikes the assertion of contract or warranty claims. So it's relevant. They, y'all made the decision to strike 1320-804-2B. And I'd like to ensure that warrant product warranties that arise as a result of negligence on behalf of the builder are included in the protections offered by um, 106. I ask for an I vote. You can call it the Julie Stop Being Wrinkled Amendment. <laughs> we don't disparage members, even ourselves. Uh, is there any further discussion of L118? Seeing none, the question before us is the adoption. Division has been called. As I said previously, a division has been called on Amendment L-118. All those in the chamber not entitled to vote, please take a seat. All those in favor of L-118, please stand. All those opposed? The chair is not in doubt that amendment is lost. Is there any further discussion of, L, of Senate Bill 106? Seeing no further discussion of Senate Bill. Great. Senator Gonzalez.
There is an amendment at the desk. Will the clerk please read? L. 121. L121, amend the zoning of Senator amendment. Gonzalez. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move L121 to Senate Bill 106. To the amendment. L121. Um, is structured quite similarly to L118. It adds a reduction in structural integrity to the list of damages that can support a negligence claim. Why does this matter? Because, I'm sorry, if a building isn't sound, you should be able to bring a claim. There, We've been talking about, well, what happens if you put on a brand new roof onto a brand new home? Well, that's covered in other areas of statute and law. Okay. What about the structural integrity of a building itself? As we've been discussing this and hearing the sponsor's reticence to expand 13... 2804, subsection 1. I think it's become clear that this language in particular, when we're talking about the structural integrity of a building and, and reduction in said structural integrity, I think we can all agree, colleagues, that if your home wasn't built to stand up, You should have grounds for a claim. If the integrity of the roof is compromised and you thereafter have water pouring in after a rainstorm, you ought to be able to bring a claim. I asked for an I vote on L121. Seeing no further discussion, the question before us is the adoption of L-121. All those in favor, say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. No. The noes have it. That amendment is lost. <laughs> Senator Priola. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, members, I move L-016. There is an amendment at the desk. Will the clerk please read L-116? L-116, amend the sentencing of floor amendment. Senate Bill... 106, L099, page 3 after line 40, insert section 4. In Senator Priola. Statutes. Okay. I've, the good senator from Park Hill wants me to read the amendment myself instead of <laughs> I'm teasing. So, first Senator of Priola, all. Senator could you now please move the amendment? Yes, I, uh, I moved it but when he was reading, so I'll move it again, though. I move L016. That um, motion is in proper order, and the amendment has now been moved okay. to the amendment to Senate Bill 106. But first, I want to give a shout out to the good senator from Westminster who I hear is listening to us during this debate. We hope you get better soon and you're back with us in the well uh, arguing bills soon. Anyway, um, so what I want to do is I'm definitely going to talk about 116, but I also want to go through some of the history of what's happened down here the last 20 some years as it relates to construction defects. Because um, I've been here for like 16 of them, and this debate is not new and unique to me. Um, one thing that has made me a little concerned and skeptical of this piece of legislation <laughs> is for years I've heard the builders say, the, the, the insurance on multifamily is very difficult, it's very expensive. Okay, I understand that. But there's still a number of multifamily homes that are being built as well as high-end condos and for the life of me, I can't understand why we aren't strategically only addressing multifamily uh, in this bill as opposed to uh, touching area of law that, that touches multi or single family as well. So back, back to kind of like a history of all the tweaks and changes, the, the loss of rights that have uh, been taken from consumers and, and given to builders. In, in 1986, there was Senate Bill 69, developers passed a bill to shorten the statute of repose to six years, um, and the statute of limitations to two. Uh, 1999, 
Amendment of the Colorado Consumer Protection Act, developers passed a bill to limit damages by increasing standards of proof. 2001, SIDAR 1, Construction Defects Action, uh, action Reform, De developers passed comprehensive statutory uh, change to limit liability of construction professionals for construction defense, defects. 2003, SIDAR 2, Construction Defect Action Reform, developers <coughs> allies amended SIDAR uh, 1 to include the opportunity to repair. 2007, getting, getting closer to when I was first elected in the House, Homeowner Protection Act. Homeowner allies passed a law that voids any wa waiver of the homeowner's legal rights, remedies, and damages as provided for uh, Sadara of two. 2008, Goodyear versus Holmes case. Developers, when then the Colorado Supreme Court rules that homeowners can no longer collect prejudgment interest on damages. 2010, uh, addition to SIDAR 2, developers pass a construction insurance bill to clarify liability policies uh, to provide insurance coverage uh, for construction defects. <clears throat> 2011, Smith versus Executive Custom Homes case, developers win when the Colorado Supreme Court affirms that the statute of limitation begins to run against a homeowner from the date the homeowner discovers any symptoms of defect. 2014, 2016, developers introduced but failed to pass bill that would eliminate jury trials. <clears throat> uh, 2014 to 2016, metro area ordinance. Developers uh, convinced mayor and city council to pass ordinance to strip rights from homeowners on condo construction defects. Uh, 2017, House Bill 1279, comprise, uh, compromise bill passed to institute a process by which homeowners and associates must provide notice and disclosure. 2017, Villaggio case. Um, this, this one was told to me that this, this was gonna solve it all, the Villaggio case. Developers win big when the Colorado Supreme Court holds that Long after construction has been completed, developers may unilaterally control how homeowners associations govern their own affairs, so on and so forth. 2018, 2018 present, homeowner, home, homeowner allies support unsuccessful attempt to limit developers' existing rights to, to cherry-pick favorable arbitrators, so on and so forth. So um, having been here for a while and, and, and heard the debates, what, what I don't understand is why we're not narrowly crafting this to only uh, multifamily units, which could be done, uh, because that is what has been said is the problem. That, that's where affordability comes in. That's where the first rung on the economic ladder to build equity comes from. And I've seen it. Very few condos have been built the last 20, 30 years. Um, and, and for the life of me, I'm, I'm not sure why. I, Sometimes I have a, a hunch because having lived here since the 80s, I remember when a lot of condos were, uh, you know, when the market falls, the condos are the first ones to lose value. But uh, other than that, I would, I would hope that we could craft, along with some of the other more uh, thoughtful legislation of density, craft bills that would encourage construction of condos such as, such as uh, the number of the bills that are still out there. So, but what L... 116 does is it simply puts a repealer on this bill for five years out and it asks that uh, the Division of Housing in the Department of Local Affairs determine that condo construction has not increased from the 2003 levels. The director of the Division of Housing shall notify the revisor of statutes and writing by 20, January 1st, 2029 if the conditions specified in this section has occurred so on and so forth. So <clears throat> it's putting on notice to the builders, if you, if you change statute that takes away rights from homeowners, multifamily and single family, if this does not change the status quo as, as dictated by the Division of Housing and the Department of Local Affairs, this area of statute will then be repealed. Um, I think if the sponsors, and I, I wanna applaud the sponsors, this is not an easy, piece of legislation. I know that they have spent many hours working in stakeholdering, uh, but my concern is that we're taking 
that we're using, we're using a crisis to um, give more rights to builders and take more rights away from the consumers, given, given the history that I went through of, of the changes that have been made the prior two decades. Uh, in the end of the day, I think affordability comes down to a number of things, interest rates, of course, uh, water scarcity in our state, we've had those debates, uh, scarcity of land, we've had those debates, and honestly, coming through the last few weeks of session, we're gonna have debates related to density. Uh, encouraging density, in my opinion, will go further to increase affordability and incentivize uh, builders to build more multifamily than, than uh, Senate Bill 106 does. But again, my opinion is 106 is being used as an opportunity for builders given the crisis that consumers are under uh, of affordability uh, for housing and the lack of available housing, especially at the low, low end of the economic, um, economic opportunity. So with that, I would again renew my ask for an eye on L116 to Senate Bill 106. Senator Coleman. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. Appreciate this amendment from the good Senator from Henderson. Uh, members, we don't want to bifurcate the policy to only one sector of the market. This bill is intended to encourage more building. We want good policy to apply everywhere. We're asking for a no vote on 116. Is there any further discussion? Senator Marchman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, are we still on Amendment L116? Yes. Thank you. Senator Marchman, we are on L116. Okay, Two, is there any further discussion of Amendment L116? Going once. Seeing none, the question before us is the adoption of L116. All those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed, no. The no's have it, and L116 is lost. Senator Marchman. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair. Um, so I had, uh, I had a meeting that I stepped out um, to meet with some folks from Excel. Um, so I missed that uh, a piece of my amendment actually got on, and I'm super excited. So I'm here to offer uh, the second part of that amendment. There is the second part of an amendment at the desk. Will the clerk please read L125? L125, amend the Zenzinger floor. Senator Marchman. Senator Marchman. Thank you so much. So what this uh, piece will do. Senator Marchman, could you please move the amendment? Oh, yes. I move L125. To the amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So what this piece will do is it'll protect our homeowners by making sure that um, they don't sign anything that would waive their rights to a construction defect. I'm gonna read it out loud. So it says it, um, any provision in law, a contract, or an association's governing, governing documents is void as against public policy if the provision contains construction defect preclaim procedures that are more onerous than those contained in this article. I had shared earlier about the fact that um, in some cases you sign, when you sign your HOA, you sign a, a, a forced right to repair. We've seen in other cases where in HOAs, um, you sign your right away for an HOA claim or an HOA to come with multiple claims. Um, and so there are a number of these things that um, exist and would leave a lot of people in my Senate district, a lot of homeowners, um, open and vulnerable to not being able to take care of the issues because the builders themselves who were negligent in their building made sure that the owners signed away their rights before they even got it. So that's an issue for uh, folks in my district. It's an issue for me. I hope you'll join me in a resounding support of L125. Senator Coleman. 
Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Appreciate this amendment. Um, as it was said earlier, we were able to adopt the first half of the amendment uh, that was brought earlier, but this particular sentence we feel somewhat invalidates any provisions and declarations with the pre-claim procedures, as, as was referred to in the Villaggio case, which permits declarations to have arbitration clauses or declarations which include a contractual provision uh, in, de in the declarations that allow the developer to repair claims prior to filing claims. And for that reason, uh, we are asking for a no vote on L-125. Is there any further discussion of L-125? Seeing none, the question before us is the adoption of L-125. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. No. The no's have it and L-125 is lost. Senator Cutter. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Nice to see you again. <laughs> Good to see you too, Senator Cutter. There's an amendment at the desk. Will the clerk please read L-22? L-122. L-122, man. Senator Cutter. Floor amendment. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd like to move L-122. So move to the amendment. Um, okay. This amendment. So builders, this... Builders must report to the Division of Housing each time a notice of claim is filed, and this report will include what the alleged defects are, where the property is located, who the builder is, whether the repair was settled, claim, whether the claim was repaired or settled, what the nature of the claim was, like decking, foundation, drainage, whatever it was. This allows the state to collect data on how many claims are filed so we can make data-driven policies. So we're asking for, this, uh, for builders to report this. It really helps answer some of the questions we've been asking all session about how many claims there actually are. We really we want to do data-driven policy, and we have not been able to get an answer. I think this is a really important amendment and one worth considering. It's about transparency. We're told these are all, there are all these frivolous claims, but we have not seen demonstration of that. We do not have proof of how many there are. I know many homeowners in my district who are buying new homes right now might want to be able to know if there are builders who have multiple issues of these claims. That seems like a fair thing to be able to understand if um, a builder has dozens and dozens of claims in a specific area or whatever. I think it's a, a consumer protection sensible piece and I would ask for your support on L-122. Senator Coleman. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. And while I fully agree with the good senator from Jefferson County um, in the ledge deck, part of what we wanted to do was include some of this information. We do believe there should be additional data information that helps us make the right decisions when it comes to policy. That said, this particular part of the bill was stricken, uh, notice of claim process. This bill focuses again on informed consent and technical code issues as claims. We're asking for a no vote on 122. Is there any further discussion of L-122? Seeing none, the question before us is the adoption of L-122. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. no. The no's have it, and L-122 is lost. Senator Cutter. Is there an amendment? I feel an amendment. Yes, indeed, there is an amendment at the desk. Will the clerk please read L-120. <laughs> L120 amendment. Senator Cutter. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move Amendment L120 to Senate Bill 106. To the amendment. So this is also is another transparency um, kind of provision. I know we've all had questions about how many defect claims are there, how many are settled, who are the repeat offenders. And I we worked a lot on this last year, and we were never able to get the answers. I was working on some legislation last year. We could not get that. And one reason we don't have this information is due to confidentiality clauses. This amendment is meant to increase transparency. Again, it's just increasing transparency. If there's a problem, let's just be sure that we make sure um, that uh, citizens, that our, our constituents know that and ensure the public can distinguish between good and not so good builders. We, had, we and potential home buyers have the right to know which builders have had problems and which ones make the effort to address issues that arise. So this is preventing builders from requiring confidentiality clauses in settlement agreements. And I would ask for your support of L120. Senator Zenzinger. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, members, 
We struck this portion of the bill, so it no longer exists in the bill. We had a lot of good ideas. Um, there were some things in there that we were hoping to do, uh, but in an attempt to meet uh, the opponents of the bill halfway, uh, we agreed to take this portion of the bill out, and so for that reason, I'd ask for a no vote. Thank you. Senator Gonzalez. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, well, luckily, we're in the upper chamber, friends, where there is no settled question. And um, while we are grateful and appreciative to the sponsors in their attempt to meet us halfway by striking uh, uh, sec the section uh, in question altogether, what you now see at, reflected as L120, um, what this amendment seeks to do is to restore um, and actually um, fix the issue, I guess repair the defect, <laughs> in um, what we see reflected in L99, the strike below, um, altogether. And so um, thankfully, uh, we've made good progress and as we continue this discussion, I think it's important that we clarify uh, this notice of claim process. I ask for an I vote because this was um, at the beginning of this process, at the, when the bill was initially introduced, addressing the notice of claim process, I understood to be the heart of the policy that was then later struck. So I ask for an I vote on L120. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, the question before us is the adoption of L120. All those in favor, say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. No. The no's have it, and L120 is lost. Senator Cutter. Well, there is an amendment at the desk. Will the clerk please read L123? L123, amendment is under your floor. Senator amendment Cutter. Control. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd like to move L123 to Senate Bill 106. So moved. All right. This deals with insurance costs for construction liability. Um, it delays implementation, implementation of the bill until a study looking at the rates, costs, rating factors, and incidents of claims is complete and released to the legislature. This allows us to get a full picture of the in insurance market in the state. And I think this answers some of the transparency um, questions that I spoke to just, just a few moments ago. And we are actually, a study is moving through the body as we speak in House Bill 1083. Um, so we've been hearing that high insurance costs are the reason condos haven't been built. And, um, you know, we, it, we think it's reasonable to understand what's going on and form policy solutions that are most effective to address the insurance rates if they do indeed prove to be high. So I ask for your support of L123. Senator Coleman. Thank you very is much, Mr. Easy Chief. as ABC. ABC. Nobody? One, two, three? Y'all look tired. Okay, we, let's hurry it up. There we go. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you to the good senator from Jefferson County. Uh, love the idea of being able to get this kind of information. That being said, I want to make sure we focus on the intent of this bill. Uh, we also have a bill, House Bill 1083, that was referenced that will hopefully provide us more information to make additional policy decisions in the future. We ask for a no vote on one, two, three. Is there any further discussion of Amendment 123? Seeing none, the question before us is the adoption of Amendment L-123. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. No. The no's have it. That amendment is lost. <laughs> Senator Cutter. There's an amendment at the desk. Will the clerk please read L117. L117, amend this Senator Cutter. Amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And um, let's see, I'd like to move L117 to Senate Bill 106. To the amendment. 
all this amendment, it looks very lengthy, but all it does is um, if it's supposed to help, if this bill is help, supposed to help decrease insurance and thus ensuring more um, homes are built, then we think it's fair to say that if insurance rates do not decrease by 2029, this, um, this legislation will repeal. I think that's a fair ask. If it's doing, you know what, it gives it an opportunity to, um, to move through and, and see if it's actually working. And if those rates don't decrease, then I think we need to repeal this and examine um, what more or different we may need to do. So I ask for your support of L117. Senator Coleman. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. And once again, I appreciate the good senator from Jefferson County and all who have brought amendments to try to improve the bill, providing additional information, uh, wanting to know what's going on with insurance in Colorado in order to build affordable housing. I also see that notice of claim process happens to also be um, in this. And so there's multiple portions of this uh, amendment that I have concerns with. And that being said, I'm asking for a no vote on 117. Is there any further discussion of L117? Seeing none, question before us is the adoption of L117. All those in favor say aye. aye. All those opposed say no. no. The no's have it, and L117 is lost. Senator Jaquez Lewis. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, we just had the concept of putting a little hold on this policy if it didn't do what it was supposed to do. So this is similar. I have an amendment. There is an amendment at the desk. Will the clerk please read L-119. L-119. Senator Jaquez Lewis. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move L-119 to Senate Bill 106. To the amendment. Thank you, sir. Uh, this is similar to what we just did, but let's just make it really plain and simple. We don't know if this policy is going to work. This policy is trying to tackle some pretty, pretty big problems for homeowners. So this amendment actually puts a three-year sunset. Now, why three years? Three years is one of the more uh, basic time frames that to see if a policy is working. Whenever we've had some new um, policies that are innovative, and sure enough, Colorado is innovative on our legislation, sometimes we use the three-year to see, and then we can reassess. This, is, this policy could either really be what we want it to do, which is allow for new condo building, new multifamily building, you know, let's get the affordable housing going, or this is really gonna hurt homeowners, especially because we haven't tweaked it enough. So this amendment, 119, says, let's give it a try. Let's give it an earnest try, but let's do it for three years and then reassess. To me, it is very reasonable to give something a trial. That's what this is. In my training, we call it a pilot. Where we do a pilot, we see if the policy is working. We see if it really is increasing affordable housing. And guess what? If it's messing up, we've put an expiration date on it so we can fix it. Very reasonable, colleagues. Let's do this for three years, and then let's re-examine. Asking for an I vote on L-119. Senator Coleman. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. I appreciate this amendment, recognizing that we want to make sure that things uh, are effective. That being said, um, we believe we've done phenomenal work with all stakeholders involved to figure out the best solution moving forward. We do also agree that we missed out on being able to do work on right to remedy. We also took out um, the notice of claim process. Um, we were able to agree at least on uh, homeowner associations uh, in terms of uh, some of the work that was under the pre-amended version out of the committee. Uh, there's other areas where we didn't, uh, but that being said, one of the concerns that I again have on this particular amendment is it does include some of the things that we did agree uh, to pull out as well uh, but the things that it continues to work on, informed consent, technical code issues, the claims, 
We believe that the bill still will address the concerns of affordable housing as well as uh, supporting our uh, individuals who are homeowners in their rights, and we ask for a no vote on 119. Is there any further? Senator Gonzalez. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> in, the in the sponsor's introduction to the introduced version of the bill during committee in our local government and housing uh, committee, we talked about the amount of time that we've been grappling with this important, complicated, nuanced issues uh, issue that has now resulted in 120 some odd amendments. Nobody said that constructing things wasn't easy. What I want to um, lift up and raise that one of the proponents' um, main arguments in support of and rationale to pass Senate Bill 106 is that we need this in order to drive down the cost of housing and encourage a return of the insurance uh, providers to, um, uh, to help restart building multifamily condos. Okay, cool. We had a big discussion about whether or not the language of 106 would then actually result in a return, a reduction of liability and in turn uh, a return from insurance providers to the multifamily for sale housing space. Let's give it three years. And if it doesn't work, Sunset the bill. Ask for an I vote on the amendment. Is there any further discussion of L-119? Seeing none, the question before us is the adoption of L-119. All those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed, no. no. No's have it, that amendment is lost. To the bill, is there any discussion? Any discussion of Senate Bill 106? Going once, going twice. The question before us is the adoption of Senate Bill 106. All those in favor, say aye. aye. Opposed, no. no. The ayes have it, and Senate Bill 106 is adopted. Is, oh. You know, if you'd been on time, the chair recognizes the majority leader, Senator Robert Rodriguez. Thank you, Chairman Bridges. The pleasure is mine. I move the committee rise and report. The motion is for the committee to rise and report and put their jackets back on. All those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed, no. Eyes have it. The committee will rise and report. The Senate will come to order, and Senator Gardner will be fined one dollar. It's, it's still not on. I think that's it's $2 still not at on. this point. <laughs> Senator Bridges. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. The committee has met and had a number of bills under consideration. Will the clerk please read the report? 
April 10, 2024, Mr. President, your committee of the whole begs leave to report it as had under consideration of the following attached bills being the second reading thereof and makes the following recommendations thereon. Senate Bill 187 is amended and Senate Bill 106 is amended, passed on second reading and ordered and gross and placed on the calendar for third reading and final passage. House Bill 1259 is amended, passed on second reading and ordered revised and placed on the calendar for third reading and final passage. House Bill 1429 laid over until April 11, 2024 and retaining its place on the calendar. Senator Bridges. Thank you, Mr. President. I move the anticipation of cows, the report. There is an amendment at the desk. Will the clerk please read amendments? One. Amendment one, Senator Corker moves Senator to amend Corker. the report of the committee. Thank you, Mr. President. I move uh, cow amendment uh, 001 to Senate Bill 106. To the amendment. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, this amendment, uh, colleagues, if you recall, was actually originally Amendment 103, and this is an important amendment to me that gets me to be able to vote yes on this bill. Um, and it's important because it clears up some things um, that are already in our statutes. Uh, it states that it uses unreasonable risk of bodily injury and an unreasonable reduction in the capability um, and it replaces verifiable danger and lack of capacity. And why this is important, if you search the Colorado statutes, you will find unreasonable mentioned over more than 388 times. You will find verifiable, verifiable danger not mentioned at all in our statutes. And you will find lack of capacity mentioned seven times, all in reference to mental fitness. So by putting this amendment into the bill. We are reducing the court cases to establish the verifiable danger and to establish the lack of capacity, because that's what's going to happen, colleagues. They're going to be spending money and time trying to establish what these mean when we already know what unreasonable means. For that, I urge and I vote. Thank you. Senator Cole. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Again, members, I'm asking for a no vote on this cow amendment. The difference in discussion regarding the language uh, that is found again on page three for L99, uh, verifiable danger versus uh, unreasonable risk, actual failure versus unreasonable reduction in capability has already been addressed. We ask for a no. The question for the body is the adoption of Cal Amendment 1. Are there any no votes? Senators Van Winkle, Rich, Baisley, Will, Gardner, Minority Leader Lundeen, Smallwood, Kirkmeyer, Liston, Pelton B, Pelton R, Simpson, Hansen. Roberts, Mullica, Janal, Zenzinger, Henriksen, Bridges, Fields, Coleman, Michael Sinjane, Buckner. With a vote of 11 ayes, 23 noes, Zero absent, one excused. The amendment is lost. There is another amendment at the desk. Will the clerk please read Amendment 2? S02, Senator March, Senator moves to amend March. the report. Thank you, Mr. President. I move Cal Amendment 2. To the amendment. Great. So um, I've had the opportunity to get to speak about this amendment extensively today, three different times on three different um, propositions. I just want to make sure that we are in a position where we are not um, keeping our, uh, that our homeowners are not waiving their rights to construction defect claims because builders and others have put into contracts that they're not allowed to bring claims or they're, they have to have a higher bar, for instance, if it is mold 
or you have to do a forced mediation or a forced right to repair. All of these things interfere with the bill that we're drafting and put homeowners in great jeopardy. I ask for your I vote on S002. Senator Zinzik. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, members, I ask for a no vote. Um, the first half of this original amendment we accepted, but the second half, um, we just really feel that it invalidates any provisions and declarations with pre-claim procedures. So, for example, if you think about the Villaggio case, which permits declarations to have arbitration, and we think that that's kind of a good thing. Um, and so, uh, or declarations which include a contractual provision that would allow the developer to repair the claims prior to filing claims. And so, for those reasons, um, we were unable to accept this language from the opponents, and I would ask for a no vote. Question before the body is the adoption of Cal Amendment 2. Are there any no votes? Senators Van Winkle, Will, Baisley, Rich. Gardner, Minority Leader Lundeen, Smallwood, Kirkmeyer, Liston, Pelton B, Pelton R, Simpson, Hansen, Roberts, Mollica, Zenzinger, Janal, Henriksen, Fields, Michael Sinjane, Buckner. Bridges, Coleman. With a vote of 11 ayes, 23 noes, zero absent, one excuse, the amendment is lost. There's an amendment at the desk. Will the clerk please read Cal Amendment 3? S. Yes, Zero Three, Senator Gonzalez moved to amend the Senator report Gonzalez. of the committee at the hall. Thank you, Mr. President. I move L, I'm, I'm sorry, I move uh, Cal Amendment S003 to Senate Bill 106. To the amendment. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. Uh, this would actually restore what was uh, L104, um, the amendment to, uh, an amendment to the strike below S99. Um, that would thereafter read, um, D, an unreasonable risk of bodily injury or death to or a threat to the life, health, or safety of the occupants of the residential real property. I ask for an aye vote. Senator Coleman. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Again, this is similar to the initial Cal Amendment that changes the language to unreasonable risk of bodily injury or death. Um, for us uh, both uh, verifiable danger, unreasonable risk, as well as actual failure, unreasonable reduction in capability are two issues that were already addressed in section three that we felt there was uh, strong opposition to. The language we have, we believe, is going to help encourage more claims to be filed for folks to have their defects remedy. We asked for an, a no vote on S003. Senator Gonzalez. Thank you. Um, part of the reason that we wanted to return to this language as opposed to the verified danger language that you now see reflected in uh, S, I'm sorry, in uh, the strike below L99 to Senate Bill 106 is because there is a differential uh, between um, uh, how verified danger is proven by the fact finder. The language um, that is now reflected in L003 requires experts to come for, I'm sorry, um, the language that is um, uh, required uh, under uh, L99. Verified danger. That requires experts to come forward, test, verify, and be approved by the finder of fact in this process. Whether that's arbitration, whether that's in court, whether that's mediation, whether that's whatever the claim process is. Shouldn't we be basing our uh, processes on a reasonableness standard? 
This is a standard that would ensure that everyday common people, it's the common sense standard, perhaps. I ask for an I vote on this cow. Question before the body is the adoption of cow amendment three. Are there any no votes? Senators Van Winkle, Will, Baisley, Rich, Gardner, Minority Leader Lundeen, Smallwood, Kirkmeyer, Liston, Pelton B, Pelton R, Simpson, Hansen, Roberts, Mollica, Janal, Bridges, Henriksen, Zenzinger, Fields, Coleman, Buckner, Michelson, Janae. With a vote of 11 ayes, 23 no, zero apps, and one excuse, the amendment is lost. There is an amendment at the desk. Will the clerk please read Amendment 4? S604, Senator Gonzalez moves to amend the report of the Committee of the Whole to show that the following Sullivan Floor Amendment, L113 to Senate Bill 106, did pass. Amend the Zenzinger Floor Amendment, Senate Bill 106, L099, page 2, after line 28. Insert section 2 in Colorado Revised Statute 1320, 803.5, amend 3 as follows. Sullivan. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I move um, Cow Amendment 004 and ask for an aye vote. To the amendment, is there any discussion? Senator Cole. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Asking for a no vote on S004. Only through mutual agreement, we decided to remove notice of claim process. Again, asking for a no vote. Question for the body is the adoption of Cal Amendment 4. Are there any no votes? Senators Van Winkle, Will, Baisley, Rich, Gardner, Minority Leader Lundeen, Smallwood, Kirkmeyer. Liston, Pelton B, Pelton R, Simpson, Hansen, Roberts, Mollica, Zenzinger, Coleman, Fields, Henriksen, Bridges, Janal, Michelson Janae, Buckner. With a vote of 11 ayes, 23 noes, 0 absent, 1 excused, the amendment is lost. There's an amendment at the desk. Will the clerk please read Amendment 5? S-005, Senator Gonzalez moves to amend the report of the Committee of the Senator Whole Cutter. to show that the following. Thank you, Mr. President. I move S-005 to the Committee of the Whole. To the amendment. So in L-122, uh, L which failed, we ask for um, builders to report notices of claims of alleged defects to the Division of Housing. Um, again, this is just allowing us to collect data on how many claims are filed so we can create data-driven policy. We really want to understand how many claims there are, how many frivolous claims there are, um, so that we have that information and can make good decisions moving forward. I ask for your support. Senator Zenzinger. Thank you, Mr. President. Members, I ask for a no vote on this cow. Uh, through a mutual agreement with the opponents of this bill, we removed this section of the bill, and so I ask for a no vote. Thank you. Senator Gonzalez. Thank you, Mr. President. You know, during the committee testimony regarding this policy, I asked attorneys, I asked builders, how many claims are we talking about? Couldn't get any data. How do we know if we are actually addressing a problem if we're not willing to collect the data to demonstrate whether the policy is actually working or not? We asked for a sunset. I'm not counting this, but that. But there was a declination of the, oper uh, of the uh, amendment to sunset this bill should we not see a corresponding decrease in our insurance rates. At the very least, let's capture some data about how many of these claims are filed. Somehow, that seems to be um, untenable under this bill. 
I ask for an aye vote on the cow. Thank you. Question for the body is the adoption of cow amendment five. Are there any no votes? Senators Van Winkle, Will, Baisley, Rich, Gardner, Minority Leader Lundeen, Smallwood, Kirkmeyer, Liston, Pelton B, Pelton R, Simpson, Hansen, Roberts, Mullica, Zenzinger, Janal, Bridges, Henriksen, Fields, Michelson Janay, Buckner, Coleman. With a vote of 11 ayes, 23 noes, 0 absent, 1 excuse, the amendment is lost. Motion before the body is the adoption of the Committee of the Whole Report. Are there any no votes? Senators Gonzalez, Majority Leader Rodriguez, Colker, Sullivan. Jaquez Lewis. With a vote of 29 ayes, 5 noes, 0 absent, 1 excused, the Committee of the Whole Report is adopted. Senate Bill 187 is amended. Senate Bill 106 is amended, passed in second reading order in gross, and placed on the calendar for third reading and final passage. House Bill 1259 is amended, passed in second reading order, revised, and placed on the calendar for third reading and final passage. House Bill 1429 laid over until April 11th and retaining its place on the calendar. Consideration of resolutions. Will the clerk please read the title of House Joint Resolution 1021. House Joint Resolution 1021 by Representatives Duran and Pugliese and Senators Winter F. and Danielson concerning Sexual Assault Awareness Month and in connection therewith recognizing April as Sexual Assault Awareness Month and designating April 24th, 2024 as Colorado Denim Day. Majority Leader Rodriguez. Thank you, Mr. President. I move to lay over House Joint Resolution 1021 until Monday, April the 15th. Motion is to lay over House Joint Resolution 1021 until Monday, April 15th. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. The ayes have it. In the Resolution will lay over until April 15th. Mr. Majority Leader. Thank you, Mr. President. I move to lay over House Joint Resolution 1022 until Monday, April the 15th. The motion is to lay over House Joint Resolution 1022 until Monday, April 15th. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no? No. The ayes have it, and the resolution will lay over until April 15th. Mr. Majority Leader. Thank you, Mr. President. I move to lay over Senate Joint Resolution 19 until tomorrow, Thursday, April the 11th. Motion is to lay over Senate Joint Resolution 19 until tomorrow, April 11th. All those in favor say aye. Opposed, no. The ayes have it, and Senate Joint Resolution 19 will lay over until tomorrow. Message from the Governor. April 4th, 2024, ladies and gentlemen, pursuant to the powers conferred upon me by the Constitution and laws of the State of Colorado, I have the honor to designate, appoint, reappoint, and submit to your consideration the following member of the Colorado Commission on Judicial Discipline for terms expiring June 30th, 2027, Courtney Sutton of Colorado Springs, Colorado, to serve as a non-attorney occasioned by the resignation of Gina Lopez of Tawak, Colorado, appointed Emily Tufton Esteval of Evergreen, Colorado, to serve as a non-attorney occasioned by the resignation of Marissa Pacheco of Pueblo, Colorado, appointed. Judiciary. Signing of bills. April 10, 2024, the president has signed Senate Memorial 2. Introduction of bills. Senate Bill 205 by Senator Rodriguez, considering consumer protections and interactions with artificial intelligence systems. Judiciary. House Bill 1269 by Representatives Morrow and Frizzell and Senator Colker concerning recording fees and in connection therewith modifying fees collected by county clerk and recorders as, and delaying the electronic recording technology board's repeal and sunset review. Finance. House Bill 1328 by Representatives English and Clifford and Senator Rich concerning the continuation of the regulation of money transmitters and in connection therewith implementing the recommendations in the 2023 sunset report by the Department of Regulatory Agencies. Finance. 
Announcements. Senator Coleman. Thank you, Mr. President. Members, uh, SVMA will not be meeting today. Instead of hearing House Bill 1147, today we'll be hearing House Bill 1147 tomorrow in the old Supreme Court at 1.30. We'll make the announcement about all the bills, including that bill for tomorrow. Thank you, Mr. President. Further announcements, Senator Roberts. Thank you, Mr. President. Agriculture and Natural Resources Committee, we will meet 15 minutes upon adjournment, so please get there as quickly as you can. We have House Bill 1354 and Senate Bill 197. Senator Buckner. Education Committee will be meeting upon adjournment in room 357. We will be hearing what? Oh. Okay, upon adjournment of the other committees. Which one? Um, Which we're one? hearing. <laughs> Wait a minute, I have to come back. I don't have the right. <laughs> I'm sorry, I don't have the right. It's that time of year. Senator Sullivan. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. President. May I have a moment of personal privilege? Granted. Um, last night, apparently, there was a, a really bad accident on, on Parker Road, uh, and this morning at uh, 4.30 when I got up, um, they were talking about it, and they were saying that Parker Road um, was, was shut down. Apparently, people had flew out of the car, and um, the police were there investigating it and all of that, and um, there was going to be a, a, a closure on, on Parker Road, and it was going to impact the, um, the bus routes, and so it had the bus routes there, and uh, the 135 was going to be impacted, and that's the bus that, that I take, and so I sat there and watched and just trying to figure out, okay, well, am I going to catch you know, that and be delayed, and I was able to ask my wife if she could give me a ride um, to the train station at uh, Iliff and I would catch the H line and head on down here. So she was able to do that. And I went to the uh, uh, train station, train was right there, got down here, got off. And, and as I got off at 18th in California, there was the uh, shuttle, the 16th Street shuttle coming. And I walked right across and got on, on the 16th Street shuttle. And then it took me uh, down the, the, the road towards the Civic Center and, and my office. And I was able to get off and walk across the street to the Starbucks. And I went into the Starbucks and I uh, placed my order with the guy. And uh, when he got all finished, he said to me, he said, Alex, um, we'll have your coffee for you. And he stepped out of the way, and there was a young man with an Alex badge on him, and he handed me my coffee. And so I got to start this morning by saying, thank you, Alex. And I started to cry and laugh at exactly the same time. And so I know there's people who want me to stop this. I know there's people who say, can he kind of get over this? Isn't there something else? But Alex is right there. And he's telling me, Dad, keep it up. I'm right here. I'll be here with you. And for those reasons, and my faith, my determination, and my Irish stubbornness, I won't quit. So thank you, Mr. President. Senator Priola. Thank you, Mr. President. Again, members, uh, just a reminder that Transportation and Energy will not be meeting this evening. Senator Gonzalez. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. Um, I, I request a moment of personal privilege. Granted. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. Um, I do want to just take a brief moment um, to send my condolences to the family of Mr. Arthur Janis. You probably don't remember his name. You probably don't know who he is. He was a, an elder um, Lakota, Lakota man who found himself in Denver. He lived, um, I believe, on Pine Ridge Reservation up in South Dakota, and he found himself hospitalized uh, this winter um, at the 
uh, University of Colorado um, Hospital um, in Aurora. And while he was there, um, his hair was cut without his permission, which was a great affront to him, his dignity, his family, his community, and his culture. The family sought answers as to what had happened and why it had happened. And initially, my understanding is that Mr. Janice's family was told, no, he came in with short hair. And then later was told, oh, um, no, he um, authorized us to cut his hair. He had a difficult um, journey, and I hope that his transition to the ancestors it began on April 1st of this year. His family and his community gathered uh, on the res yesterday to honor and celebrate his life. My constituents in Denver rose up to ask questions. How did this happen? And how do we prevent it from never happening again? And the response that I got from my constituents who tried in good faith to reach out to the hospital officials the way that that response felt to those community members was they're just waiting for this Indian to die. That's the way that that felt, the lack of responsiveness. I'd hoped that Mr. Janice would live long enough to receive an apology. What a shame that he didn't. But to Mr. Janus, to the strong and vibrant Native community in Denver, and to his community in South Dakota, I offer my apology. We honor his life and legacy. And Mr. President, I request that the Senate chimes be rung. The Senate will observe a moment of silence, and the Senate chimes will ring. Senator Gonzalez. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you for giving his family that brief moment. Back to work. Our Senate Judiciary Committee will meet upon adjournment of the upon adjournment committees, whenever that is, in the old Supreme Court. We'll be hearing House Bill 1244 for action only, House Bill 1251, and Senate Bill 130 in that order. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Fields. Good afternoon, Mr. President and members. Members of the Senate Health and Human Services Committee, we will meet in 15 minutes upon adjournment. I'm going to say that's 4 o'clock. We have two bills for consideration, Senate Bill uh, 061 and House Bill 1254. Senator Buckner. I'm glad for second opportunities. 
um, Senate Education Committee will meet upon adjournment of the adjournment in room 357. We have appointments and we will be hearing two bills today. Uh, those bills are um, 1305 and 1285. Thank you. Senator Liston. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Mr. President, I have uh, spoken to the majority leader and minority leader and asked to be excused on Friday due to a medical appointment. Thank you. Senator Liston will be marked as excused on Friday. Senator Pelton. Thank you, Mr. President. I've spoken to the majority and the minority leaders, and they've given me permission to be excused Monday uh, the 15th to go walk through real bull crap instead of just this bull crap here. <laughs> the Senator Pelton R will be marked as excused on Monday for, for business that he has to take care of. Senator Gardner. Thank you, Mr. President. Well, um, the Committee on Legal Services, as near as I can tell, is going to meet upon adjournment of the upon adjournment upon adjournment committees or the later uh, of 8.15 a.m. tomorrow morning. Uh, so, uh, Committee on Legal Services tomorrow morning, and hopefully between now and then, one will re be able to return home to uh, sleep in one's bed. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Senator Cutter. Thank you, Mr. President. I have spoken to leadership and had received permission to be um, out tomorrow, Thursday, Friday, and the following Monday. Senator Cutter will be marked as excused on Thursday, Friday, and Monday and possibly Saturday or Sunday. Mr. Majority. Thank you, Mr. President. I move that the Senate adjourn until 9 a.m. Thursday, April 11th, 2024. The motion is for the Senate to adjourn. All those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed, no? The ayes have the Senate will adjourn until 9 a.m. on Thursday, April 11th, 2024. Thank you.